Okay, so today is March 18th, 2023. It's 12 o'clock uh, daylight savings time uh, in the Pacific time zone. Uh, we have Eric Dollard here on the call, and uh, uh, this will go between one hour up to possibly two hours. Um, I have a little uh, agenda of items here. We're going to touch on EPD labs in general, the conference. Um, a, uh, Eric and uh, Dr. Adrian Marsh are going to be at my shop here in Spokane for the month of April. We're going to touch a little bit more on that. Uh, there's a couple updates I think Griffin and or Eric might be sharing about Eric and Justin's uh, Tonopah updates. Um, we kind of covered a lot of what Justin was doing down there with the building and everything. And we have some extra pictures that uh, Griffin uploaded to Eric's website that I'll, I'll kind of show like a little slideshow and then he, he can narrate them. And that's uh, regarding a pro uh, one of the projects he's working on right now. And then uh, a few individual pro projects, um, I guess with uh, Griffin, uh, Eric, uh, Dr. Adrian Marsh, Jeremiah is not with us. Um, Griffin can probably share, fill us in on anything he's working on. And then possibly Bruce Gavin, I think he might be on, yeah, I see him on the call. And then a little bit on the Telerik research, and then we'll open up for Q&A. So if you're on the call, uh, if you have questions, please do not um, post your questions in the chat. Um, the chat's going to be at the bottom of the screen right here. Uh, let me just post these uh, items of what we're going to be covering in that chat so everybody can kind of see the uh, so-called table of contents of what we're going to be covering on this call. Um, so uh, the organization which was set up to uh, help uh, support Eric's work, um, which is heavily involved in the uh, real Tesla research, electrical engineering, and uh, including uh, the math, uh, other projects that we have uh, shown at the uh, different conferences um, is what EPD Laboratories Inc. is all about. It's a 501c3 nonprofit corporation based out of uh, Nevada, and it solely operates on uh, donations. Um, I want to show uh, Eric's website here real quick. Um, if you go to ericpdollar.com, this is his homepage here. And you can scroll down, read some of the blog posts. There's posts that go all the way back to uh, May 24, 2014. Uh, there's also some, uh, oh, actually, let me do a screen sharing here. I forgot. So I'll share the screen here so you can see uh, what I'm referring to. <clears throat> so you should be seeing uh, Eric's homepage right here, which is ericpdollar.com. There's a bunch of links up here on different topics, free papers and free videos. I'd recommend going through and watching these if you haven't. Uh, these are videos that he's give uh, presentations he's given at the different conferences, uh, some books, a uh, bunch of blog posts. Um, also, you can go to directly to forward slash donate. And if you go there, that'll take you to a page which has uh, donation information, which uh, EPD Laboratories, Inc., we can accept donations by checks, money orders through the mail. Uh, they can be sent to the Spokane address, and then I sign them since I'm the uh, treasurer of the uh, organization. And then I forward those checks down to the bank in uh, Nevada. And there's the most common way everybody is donating is if you click this donate link, you can donate by PayPal. And there is an option that you can click to make your donation recurring, even if it's $5 a month, $20 a month, everything helps, that pays the bills and uh, gives Eric the opportunity to have a place where he can uh, write, you know, write his notes, turn these into books. Uh, we get these out and it all supports the other projects that you've heard about on the last few uh, Zoom calls. And a lot of that is relevant to a lot of the presentations. Um, <clears throat> Eric, do you want to touch on uh, anything first or do you want me to talk a little, kind of lead into the conference and go, go into what, what's going to be happening in April here? Yeah. That's uh, probably would be the best. Just okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So the uh, <clears throat> coming up here on in July of this year, uh, July fifth through the ninth. Um, can you see the uh, conference page right here? Is that what's showing? Yeah. Yes, it's showing. Okay. So this website is energysciencenconference.com. This is the main website for the um, uh, energy conference with the agenda on here. On the home page, it'll kind of give the basic breakdown and and the, the, the ticket links uh, down here, get your tickets here or this Energy Science Technology Conference link. That'll take you to emediapress.com. That's where you can buy the tickets. Right now, almost uh, 
uh, one half of all the in-person uh, tickets are already sold out. So if you want to come uh, meet with us in person with Eric, Dr. Adrian Marsh, Griffin Brock, all the other presenters, um, there's only 36 tickets left. And so right now would be a time to get them because these will sell out before the conference. Um, if you're not able to make it to Spokane, there's 47 live streaming tickets. Um, we're just limiting it to 50 tickets because if we go uh, over a certain amount, then it's a big jump in the bandwidth that we have to pay, which goes up from hundreds of dollars to a couple thousand dollars. So in any case, um, it's in 15 weeks here. Um, if you come here in the main menu bar, there's a 2023 conference schedule link. And if you click on that, um, I just updated this last night. I'll just run through the agenda of the conference real quick. <clears throat> on Wednesday, Dr. Adrian Marsh is going to be giving a uh, hour and a half presentation on the Toltec teachings. Uh, Wednesday is usually dedicated to like uh, health and wellness, uh, miscellaneous type of uh, presentations, more philosophical or whatever. Um, after that will be a uh, presentation by one of our sponsors. Um, I don't wanna say what it's about yet, uh, but it does deal with a motor uh, on some bench tests where the exhaust coming out is cleaner than the air going in it with a uh, estimated uh, thermal efficiency of about 80%, which defeats what's supposed to be possible with a, a gasoline powered engine. Um, I'm still confirming about two or three different presenters that we'll be putting up. Uh, also, I just received a confirmation. Uh, many of you probably have heard of C60, which are these little micro sized uh, buckyballs, uh, little carbon particles shaped like a Buckminster Fuller geodesic dome uh more spherical and this has been used for anti-aging in one study in the past it outright uh extended the life of mice by over 200 percent literally that's profound and uh ian mitchell is uh actually the uh leading authority on the subject of the c60 and he replicated that study he'll be coming to the conference to share about the C60. He'll show how, how you can make it yourself if you want the right way, because there's a lot of misinformation and bad recipes online on how to make it, uh, or you can get it through his company, uh, but you will learn the ins and outs of that and what the reality is. Um, the next day on Thursday, Sky Huddleston. Uh, Huddleston has presented on the Bork engine uh, a few times, which is a, a detonation engine that runs best on the lowest octane fuel possible. And it's uh, the most efficient way to convert linear uh, reciprocating motion into rotary motion. Uh, he has developed a 125 cc version. He'll be running and demonstrating that as well as one of the original Bork 30 cubic inch engines he has running. And he'll be showing that as well. And uh, there'll be another demonstration here uh, with a friend of mine who's been coming to the conferences uh, and myself will be co-presenting on a uh, mechanical device, which is a gravity amplifier. He has a full scale replica. It's not working. It's based on a late 1930s technology, but you're going to get more information on that than you've ever seen online. And the uh, real situation on how the mechanics of that work, because it's uh, completely false that uh, gravity is not a source of potential. It is a source of potential that can do mechanical work. And you're gonna see the uh, uh, ins and outs on that. Uh, Paul Babcock is going to be presenting on some of the uh, battery swapping modules that's used on Mike Clark's uh, self-running motor that keeps itself charged up while producing net mechanical work at a shaft that can be used to generate electricity without depleting the batteries running the system. And these are going to be modules that we're going to be looking at making available to experimenters who want to be able to incorporate some of these principles in their own builds. Uh, Haka says, who's normally on these calls, uh, he'll be giving a presentation. Um, he said here pretty soon he'll have the uh, title and demonstration um, of it. Uh, Griffin is going to be doing a uh, two-hour presentation on the Tesla radiant matter tube and related phenomenon. So if you go to his website, which is griffingbrock.com, or you go to Eric Dollard's uh, website, you'll see some of the blog posts, which are uh, going over some of these shadow graph experiments and some of these uh, uh, interesting uh, single type of uh, electrode uh, tubes. I think he's going to touch a little bit on that. There's a few pictures we're going to be showing. Um, Eric Dollard is going to be giving a four-hour presentation on the history theory and practice of four-phase systems, uh, which there's not a lot of information out there about that. So, of course, when Eric gives a four-hour presentation, it will be the definitive 
presentation on the subject. You can uh, guarantee that. And then uh, him and I will give an hour and a half presentation on the uh, audio bay. That's the big modulator bay, which is the uh, all the, the rack units for the audio. And then there's a radio frequency one, which still needs to be developed. Um, and the audio one is kind of a universal test unit to do different experiments relating to the Trump generator um, splitting water without energy or dielectric separation of water, uh, which is opposite of uh, uh, electrolysis. It can be used for some of the cosmic induction gener generator projects. And so in April, we plan on finishing that, bringing that to completion and demonstrating as much as we can at the conference. Um, Saturday, uh, Dr. Adrian Marsh will be giving a presentation on the golden ratio discharge. So if you saw his presentation last year, which was a four hour presentation on uh, a lot of the advanced measurement methods using a vector network analyzer to look at all these resonant points and these uh, coils and, and which takes your tuning to the next level. Plus, he did some demonstrations replicating Eric Dollard's golden ratio discharges that Eric did decades ago. He's the first one that showed virtually the identical type of uh, discharges, and he's going to take that uh, probably deeper than that subject's been taken, and that's also going to be a four-hour presentation, so that'll be a pretty heavy uh, deep dive into that whole subject. And then uh, Eric Dollard will be doing a musical presentation. Uh, we don't have the title of that yet, but that'll be uh, one of Box Fugues, which is a, I guess you could say, a four-quadrant uh, musical piece, which Eric will be discussing and that is, I guess, what kind of an application of the uh, mathematical presentation on the four phase system. And uh, then uh, Paul Babcock, we're gonna be talking about a water technology. Uh, I don't wanna say anything about that on this call right now, but that's uh, kind of a game changing thing that we want to be able to put in people's hands. So st stay tuned for more information on that. And then finally, we'll wrap it up with uh, Jeremiah Ferwerdo will be doing a dem uh, demonstration and a presentation on a production ready prototype of a Tesla turbine using a six inch uh, uh, discs. And this will be running on a relatively low thermal differential between a hot and a cold, the heater tank and a condenser tank. Uh, recently we got it on a test. He got it up to a 46,000 RPM and then one of the fiberglass dis discs uh, exploded. So we're gonna look at possibly uh, tr turning this into a uh, titanium disc uh, rotor uh, which will be uh, sufficient for anything that we want to throw at it, including combustion tests and then some uh, panel discussions. So needless to say, this conference is going to be jam-packed again, nonstop for five days, about 17, 16, 17 presenters, giving about pres 20 presentations. So you don't want to miss it. Um, if you want to see, you know, some of the leading experts in the uh, 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 dealing with Tesla, not just talking about theory and this and that, but we're going to show you a lot of stuff. So it's a conference that you don't want to miss. Um, anything in particular you want to you want to jump into, Eric, and kind of describe what what the agenda is for April? So er Eric will be coming up to Spokane. Dr. Adrian Marsh will be flying in, and the entire month of April we're going to be hammering on a whole bunch of projects simultaneously. So you want to take it from here, Eric? Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of preliminary yet, but uh, like you say, to get the modulator bay finalized and tested and all that and then uh, see how far we can go on the uh, the cosmic induction generator and the uh, the flame speaker end of it and whatever else in between so right now i'm uh i'm working on the presentations so i'm doing the bach right now so the the title of the 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 musical part will probably be uh, four-phase sequence algebra as applied to Box BWV 536, uh, the fugue in A major. So I'm thickly involved in that now. I was actually going to start playing parts of it today, but the batteries were dead in the synthesizer. And uh, I have to, as far as the four-phase uh, Fortescue part of it goes, I'm wrapping that up. And then the history of, uh, of Tesla's four phase at, at the Chicago World's Fair and the Niagara facility, I still have to do some English language parts on that. Uh, presently, as far as the music end of it goes, the big snag is I cannot get the necessary technical support to get the music that's derived out of this play. So that uh, um, 
I don't know if I'm going to be able to overcome that obstacle or not. I'm not proficient at sitting down and playing Bach organ music. I mean, I can peck out one, one line at a time, but that's the only hold up there right now. And uh, I don't know. It's uh, if I bought my, my uh, folder out, do you think that uh, this camera would pick up what I'm working on? I lost your audio, Aaron. I think it's a little bit pixelated because you're, you're, you're. Let me give it a try and see. Okay. You're on an old DSL connection, so the bandwidth is not that great. Is this, uh, does this appear? Um, let's see. Get a little bit closer and, and hold it real still. Okay. Yeah, it's a little blurry. Does that look blurry to you, Griffin or Adrian? That's fairly blurry. Yeah, it's yeah, kind it's, of blurry. It's, I mean, we can see the. Yeah, we can see the triangles on the graph if you want to just explain generally kind of what. Yeah, so what, this is the um, this is the Fortescue mathematics being applied to fourth phase. So this is basically before I started, this is what I was working on. And the, uh, the musical stuff is rather novel. Let me get that. It's a real exercise in coordinate shifts and. Uh, and lizard eye reading of trying to read the music. <laughs> lizard eye reading. And uh, so this is the uh, this is the arch form of the piece of Bach music. So I've had to convert from the normal musical notation to more of an oscillograph notation. And so basically, I'm breaking <clears throat> the musical terminology and and symbolism into more mathematical terminology and symbolism. And then uh, using the Fortescue concept to analyze this piece of box music. I've never done anything like this before. It's uh, actually quite fascinating. So each, each square is what's called the sequence. And then I have to break these sequences down. I have to find somebody that can play them and then combine them. So. This has uh, been keeping me quite busy the past couple of weeks, and uh, it's working out well, and I'm learning an awful lot from it. It's quite fascinating. So that's kind of what's happening presently. Okay, so, so that's on the uh, four-phase um, topic, which your like, both presentations are going to be related to that at the conference. And then you're mentioning the uh, uh, the audio, the uh, modulator bay. So what you see, this is the old shop. You can see on the right side, here's a uh, uh, the bay with all these uh, face plates, 19-inch uh, pa uh, rack mat panels that we cut out. So this is all pretty much done from scratch. And uh, on the left side, you can see where it's a little bit more complete. This one is the audio one, and this uh, rack right here is for the uh, the radio frequency stuff. Um, so it's come a long way from, from this point to where it is right now. The audio one is about 95% done. All the units just need to be pulled out so that, uh, Eric can test them. We can put them back in and do the final wiring. Um, let's see, here's, uh, this is out of like what an old B-17 bomber or something like that tuning unit. And this was placed into a new case as part of the uh, radio frequency side of it. Um, I don't want to play these videos. This is the. Uh, it's not direct. That's the rectifier for That's the RF direct. bay. For the RF bay, okay. Yeah. And then a few pictures here. This is uh, this is part of the radio frequency one. So these are all built from scratch. It's a miracle we even found all the parts on eBay to to do all this. Um, but this is an example, a little bit close up picture of some of the units that that we built. That was quite a project. So you can see the radio frequency one coming to come coming together here. The audio one is a little bit more complete than this right now. But that's essentially what we're going to be completing is this one right here. From the front side, it looks complete. So again, testing and then assembling and do the final final wiring. Um, and that's the other part of it. Uh, uh, let's see what else we're going to be working on. I don't know if anybody saw the uh, Trump generator uh, presentation 
uh, from last year's conference. It's basically an electrostatic generator that is so-called kind of reactionless. You take a load from it and it does not bog down the prime mover and you charge these uh, rotating capacitors. Um, now, I don't know, wh whose video do you see right now? I have a pin on Eric's. Griffin, do you see er Eric's video or just mine or? I could see both. Oh, you can see both, okay. So, um, cause what I'm seeing on this admin screen is completely different from what everybody else sees. So it's kind of kind of hard for me to tell what, what everybody's looking at. But the Trump generator was a uh, topic that me and Eric co-presented last year. Eric did it remotely over uh, uh, a, stream, uh, a live call. And uh, basically, you charge up these rotating capacitor plates and you spin them. And the capacitance uh, oscillates back and forth between two halves. But when you're taking uh, power out of the uh, back side of the thing, it doesn't deplete the charge on the capacitors. It's like it's completely independent of it. And when you put a load on it, it doesn't slow down the mover, the motor turning the capacitors. Of course, that was a flea power demonstration in open air when it should really be way higher speed under vacuum with a lot higher voltages. But it was enough to kind of, you know, show the principle and the audio uh, modulator bay, the output of that could potentially, as Eric has said on multiple calls before, um, that might be able to actually run that generator like a motor putting that sine wave into there at that high voltage, which would be kind of novel and something that nobody has ever done. And so that would be unique. So it's possible we might be able to make some progress um, in April on that, uh, at least the design for the uh, Trump generator that could be used as a motor. Um, and a Adrian, do you want to cover a little bit about what you plan on doing here in April? You're going to be working with us on, on some of oh. these projects, doing some of the RF stuff and Sure. I'll be working um, uh, alongside um, Eric and Aaron. Um, obviously, we'll be looking to complete what's already been said with the audio bay. Um, we take a look at the RF bay um, as well. That's also a good opportunity for me to get up to hands-on speed um, with, the, with the project as well. So we'll be doing that. Um, we also... Eric and I will probably take a deeper look at the at the golden ratio discharge, so the generator system that I used last year um, um, did, uh, denoted that to ESTC. So there are some modifications um, that I want to make um, to that for ESTC up and coming. Um, and also, um, Eric wasn't at the conference last year, so he's not had a chance to have a look at that generator and we see what's in it and um, look at its characteristics. So we'll be doing some of that. I think also, Aaron, we plan to have a look, um, see what kind of facilities we might have for making a good RF ground um, there at your shop as well, uh, see what's possible. That, will th I think, will be quite important for, for experiments in the future. So a lot of things. Um, I think also this is a first opportunity where we've had to spend – an extended period of time working. I mean, normally it's not easy when I live in the UK and everyone else is in the US. So being in one place um, for a good period of time, I think we're going to be able to make a lot of progress on a lot of things. So I'm anticipating quite a quite a creative and a quite a um, um, productive and practical and inspired um, time for that whole month. I think it's going to be very good, Aaron. Okay. Um, and there'll be a couple other people who will be coming to the or to the shop um, that are into electrical engineering and some of the ra radio frequency stuff, and they'll be there to help as well. Uh, one of them is Adam Griffin. He presented on the little wireless kit several years ago at the Hayden Eagles Lodge, and he's uh, helped Eric with some some math. Uh, problems he was working on before and he'll be stopping in periodically to to lend a hand and uh, uh as soon as you get to spokane uh adrian i'd like to him, him to come over to kind of get caught up real fast and wherever he's able to uh, uh pitch in with his uh, knowledge and skills um he'll be more than happy to uh assist in any way that he can um and of course we'll have a couple people at the shop you know some of my own em employees and and stuff will be able to, we'll be working on our own stuff with the MWOs and all this other stuff, but we will uh, be available to do, you know, some of the grunt work, <laughs> you know, metal work, fabrication, whatever it takes, you know, since we do have pretty much full machine shop there. 
Um, um, let's see. Tonopah updates. Should I go into some of the uh, Tonopah updates, Eric or Griffin, yeah. with some yeah. of the pictures you uploaded? Yeah, let's okay. do that. Okay. Quite a few pictures. So this is mainly a snapshot of what occurred. Okay. So I'll uh, let me bring up Eric's website so we can see the pictures there. Just a second. Last call, uh, we went over quite a bit of the ones with Justin, you know, doing repairs on the shack and working on, and I think there's some other pictures on the gas tank grounding and all that. Um, if there's any pictures down here that you want me to show, just let me know, Griffin. I think we covered a few of these last time, but the seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Do you want me to start from left to right or right to left with this one over on the right? Looks like a co uh, coil form. Oh, I think that'll be reserved for the individual project sections when we get there. Uh, that's okay. irrespective of the Tonopah. Okay. Do you want me to go over some of the Tonopah ones? It'll be kind of redundant with uh, some of the stuff that Justin did, but I can cover whatever you want. Sure. It's, uh, it's up to Eric. I mean, if he wants to expound upon the images, uh, these are some freshly... Okay. New images that uh, Justin Miller was kind of enough to send to me. So they start from the beginning. This we didn't talk about last time. Do you want to, you want to quickly go, go through some of these? Yeah, this is the um, starting to get the rack assembly together to go in the cable TV shack for the, the weather and uh, related uh, receiving, I would not receiving, but the... Uh, measurements and getting it out on the air, which will contain whatever part of the seismic project that we can get together. So that's kind of, uh, it was kind of a throw together that some people put together up there that didn't work and all that. And the shack, uh, I, I wish that we had had the time and what have you to do a, a time sequence of, of the work, because that's that when we first got a hold of that facility, it was nothing but uh, uh, a bunch of lumber getting ready to blow away in the wind. It had been vandalized and what have you, and the amount of work it took to make the thing radio frequency tight, to make it rack tight, and to make it secure, and all the proper grounding and all that is that's that's the effort we're at now. So. So basically, most of the carpentry work has been done. Uh, I'd say probably 90 percent is something that needs to be finished up. That's everything about the, the cable TV system here in Tonopah was just all, all half cockeyed, this and that and what have you. In fact, we still have to clean up a, a certain amount of that here in town that's hanging on the power company's poles and, and what have you. So that, that was the original setup there, which was not reliable and uh, basically not calibratable or anything. So, so we had, all that stuff had to come apart and uh, get refitted into a rack. Here's getting into some of the carpentry work again. Ju Justin's the one that's the expert on that, of, you know, what what had to be done, which was quite a bit because it was all cobbed together and, and basically in a, in a replacement manner, he had to uh, completely rebuild the thing from scratch. It was and quite, it, uh, and it used quite a bit of lumber too. It's uh, it was several thousand dollars worth of material, but, but now it's, uh, it's looking good. And that's it, it's inside the garage. That is the, uh, those are the racks that are supposed to go at the uh, seismograph location at the mine, but um, we seem to have difficulty finding any uh, contractor or what have you to give an estimate on how to properly secure the mine. And it'll also be very expensive. So that uh, is still up in the air yet. This is, uh, this looks like some of the, that's the back of Justin's truck. Okay, that's the uh, the mud hole behind the building that we're trying to get it so that it's not a quicksand pit that required moving a lot of gravel from mine tailings. That's some of the original uh, 
radio stuff that was put in the cable TV shack. This is the gravel hauling. We go out to the mine tailings to get all the old rock. That's what we use to uh, secure uh, the burial of the butts, the utility poles, and the and to make the ground drivable and what have you. That's uh, inside the garage again. It's, that's up at the hilltop. That's the base of the pole that we have to put the, uh, the VHF antennas on. So we made some progress on getting all the cross arms. That's the, uh, the shack as it stands right now, pretty much in its complete uh, structural form. That's the dog. <laughs> <laughs> and some more stuff in the back of the truck. Yeah, that's back to the backyard of the building again. It's uh, the gravel going in. 144 buckets of gravel. It's, uh, okay, that's that's inside the uh, the garage. So these are the cable TV shack uh, racks that Justin's beginning to assemble. What you see on the bookshelves there is a collection of what are known as the bell system practices, which are very rare anymore. And that has all the all the standards of uh, what used to be called the bell system, the eighth wonder of the world. I was lucky enough to get uh, uh, quite a few volumes that have priceless information in them. They need to be in a better location, but that's where they're at now, kind of in the way of other stuff. That's our cross arm uh, collection. That's the cable TV shack racks going together. That's the hilltop where the shack sat. Some more stuff in the back of the truck. That's another view of the shack. This is uh, somewhere out in the middle of nowhere. It's all, it's all the middle of nowhere here. It's <laughs> about it. If you want to be in the middle of nowhere, this is the middle the middle of nowhere. <laughs> okay, more shack details. That is the new pole that Envy Energy put in for us. So we have to reciprocate now and uh, put our pole in. Uh, and any attempts to uh, get any contractors interested have been a complete failure. So... At any rate, uh, Justin and I will have to put our poll in ourselves, and we are also obligated to uh, remove some more of the cable TV garbage off of their polls, uh, which is a big, expensive project also. But we try to gnaw away at it a little bit here and there. Okay, and that's kind of the, the new door going in. That's what it looked like. Go back to that one. That's kind of some artwork there. Yeah, that, that's that's what that's what we started with with the you know pornographic uh, graffiti on the bulkhead and dangling busted boards from up above and rat shit all over the floor and equipment that doesn't work and uh, snow builds up inside the building just as rapidly as it does outside and and that's how we began this. So these are all pretty much the same stuff. That's inside the garage. That's more of the racks that are supposed to go out of the mine. See this I'm looks missing. like uh, that's yes. the Alex Anderson coil. This is the uh, Griffin is building the steel <clears throat> model of the Bolinas Alex Anderson coil, which we're planning to use as the uh, the Tesla transformer on the Telluric test platform here when uh, if we can get the funding to get this work project here in May, uh, we're gonna finish the Telluric test platform that connects to the, uh, the water-filled tanks that are in the ground to use as the ground system, which uh, measurements show are very effective ground. So, so we actually have the, uh, the less than one ohm ground that's required to do a lot of the experiments. So the cross arms and the, uh, the grounding bus bars and the rest of that will be hooked up and then we'll put this thing on the platform 
and do some tests. So Griffin is presently, as we speak, uh, constructing this. We'll probably have some more pictures here. Yeah. Do you want uh, Griffin to narrate the rest of them? I think there's like six more pictures. and Yeah, uh, what, what, what he's working on, yeah. I yeah. suppose uh, well, we could segment our way into the telluric research that myself, uh, Dr. Adrian Marsh, and Bruce Gavin has been conducting. Do you want to uh, have Lakes. any more comments? Do you have any more comments on this particular picture, Griffin? Yeah, so let's see. Uh, this project was started about a couple days ago. It's a very laborious project, and I say that with an understatement, because the Bolinas coil, uh, more particularly the shunt potential coil, consists of varying insulators on 10 posts individually. And based off photos that uh, are on Eric's website uh, sent by some anonymous person from Sweden that shows the SAQ station or the Alexanderson station located there. Going based off those photos, as well as Eric's private research back in the 80s on this uh, type of antenna system, I was able to deduce the exact proportions and measurements of such a coil. So like Eric was alluding to, that the idea in the overall telluric research is that we have to get very well below the broadcast frequency or the amateur frequencies to obtain any efficient results. So that means anywhere below 500 kilocycles or, I mean, generally speaking, below one megacycle. So this coil is designed to operate at around 800 kilocycles, give or take. It does not exactly facilitate I suppose, legal uh, transmission of communication or information, but it will suffice as a receiving element. So this coil has 10 insulating supports made of polyethylene, which are shown as these white jagged edges. And each post or each insulator contains eight notches individually. So there are 100 posts in, in total, or 100 insulating stands, and 800 notches individually in total. So the way this coil is constructed is that as opposed to the typical, I guess, uh, horizontal, vertically wound coil, which is commonplace anywhere, that this is more of a multiplicity of individual coils, where we have more of a stacked pancake arrangement and electrically, this becomes more efficient at very low frequencies, as it was employed in the Alexanderson um, mode of transmission. And this is essentially what's being replicated. Now, it is a very tedious project in terms of winding the wire, because you have to take into consideration the wire from slipping off the grooves. And that's why the grooves have to be calculated and cut in such a manner to avoid that. And possibly if it could be seen off the screen, but I have the coil right behind me, which is being wound as we speak. It's very difficult. The actual first successful wound was completely destroyed about a couple hours ago because of what I was talking about, the wire slipping. So that's why it has to be taken into consideration very precisely uh, so that to avoid any slippage of the wire. But once it's finally completed, uh, probably within the next day, it will be tested on the telluric platform that I have here. It's not ideal. Uh, it does have a decent impedance to it. Uh, granted, the dielectrically insulating soil that I have within, uh, within the San Gabriel Valley. But nonetheless, it is a very large capacity, so we could achieve some primordial measurements with this type of coil. Now, in this photo, the ground strap, or I guess the connecting strap, which is about a one inch, in this case, one inch thick uh, copper strap, which moves around the perimeter of the base of the coil, that'll be the connecting lead that has not been established just yet, nor has the capacitive ring atop the coil. So those are additions which will be acquired within the next day or so. So this is the primordial beginnings of the scale Alexanderson shunt potential coil. And for everybody's re reference, um, 
What do you think the best reference is, Eric, for people to understand what this is about? Maybe Wireless Giant of the Pacific or? Yeah, Wireless Giant of the Pacific. That was my archaeological study of the RCA Marconi facility in Bolinas. Okay. Is my screen still up? Yes. You're showing things. Yeah, there you go. Okay, let me go to that. So on emediapress.com. Uh, you can find Wireless Giant of the Pacific. This is a pretty packed uh, uh, book. Uh, Wireless Giant of the Pacific is the RCA, what Marconi Bolinas station nickname. And that was used for ship to shore communication using that type of Alexander system back in the war. Um, no, Al the Alexander system was point to point. Uh, <clears throat> It was an adaptation of the Marconi uh, system, which did not work. And the, there was two Marconi stations. There was uh, the one in New Brunswick, New Jersey, and the one in Bolinas, California. So in the, uh, the pre-radio days or the wireless days, um, uh, when the Navy uh, kicked uh, Marconi out of the, the United States and seized his stations, uh, New Brunswick was uh, was taken over by Alex Anderson and General Electric and Steinmetz, and so was Bolinas, and they had modified those stations, and Bolinas was given the call letters KET, and it was to be point to point from Bolinas, California to uh, Hawaii, and WII was the call letters given to the New Brunswick station. And that was for transmission to, um, I don't know what was on the other side back then. I know one of them was in Sweden. And these particular two stations um, were configured in such a manner that is, uh, that is not talked about in any of the common uh, information on the Alex Anderson system. In fact, the common ins information on the Alex Anderson system, including what RCA taught me when I was young, is absolutely not correct. It's only a special application of, uh, of the generalized system. The generalized system was first built in Bolinas and New Brunswick. And then, um, then when Radio Corporation of America was formed to take over at that point, the uh, the vacuum tube uh, power oscillator came into being, and uh, HF radio uh, was moving in on top of uh, the lower frequency stuff, and then the entire Alexander system was pretty much scrapped. Other than uh, what was left was re-energized during World War II for submarine communications. Okay. And an easy way for people to find this um, so they know uh, the full history of, of that uh, station, Wireless Giant of the Pacific, that'll bring you to this page. And then the buy button, if anybody wants to get the full package, it'll forward you to emediapress.com to get that. Eric's book is almost 400 pages. Then there's a book by Dewey Livingston, who I think worked for the National Park Service or something like that. And I think it was... Dewey Livingston was a local historian. And then once I had initiated this historic resource study, uh, then the, the agency that has custody of the RCA facility in Bolinas is the National Park Service, and they had contracted with Dewey Livingston to, um, to uh, work on this from the more you know, English language, regular history standpoint. And then, uh, then we found out uh, much to his horror that uh, with agitation by Commonweal and uh, unknown forces that this whole thing became uh, highly suppressed and he was threatened and his wife was threatened and uh, and he uh, disappeared from the operation and his his writings vanished. But uh, because we worked together, I managed to have a rough draft. And thank God I did, because uh, that is no longer available. It's a, a suppressed information. And uh, so you basically, when you get this, you get to read his effort, uh, which was rather extensive. He's a local historian, a very well-known local historian in the, uh, the West Marin area. 
and he did an absolutely beautiful job of getting into the more uh, commonplace history of the station and the personalities involved and, uh, and what have you. So basically we worked as a pair on this. I did more of the, um, you know, the engineering end of it. And he did more of the personality end of it. And consequently, this is the, the definitive uh, publication on the subject. And then there's a group called the San Francisco Tesla Society. And I gave a couple presentations there on the, the Bolinas Alexanderson system. Uh, one was thoroughly suppressed and is can't be found anywhere. Uh, most of the other material was suppressed, but somebody managed to get it released. But key information has been edited out. But uh, but that one, what's left of it, can be found on YouTube. So is that the history of the Marconi RCA station Bolinas video? Yeah. yeah. So so if you go to Eric uh, P. Hey. Dollar. If you go to ericpdollar.com, you can mouse over this free videos link in the main menu bar, and you can scroll down, and here's this, this link called History of the Marconi RCA Station, Bolinas, California. You click on that, and that'll bring you to the page where you can watch it for free right here. Uh, San Francisco Tesla Society presentation Eric gave years ago on the uh, subject. So, um, okay. Well, let me jump back to this picture, and uh, you, you may go ahead and forward to the next one, Griffin. Oh, unless we wanted to get into the telluric research. Okay. Uh, Can we find a, a picture of one of these in actuality? Yeah, so that's what I was going to say, that yeah, on, Eric's, uh, on Eric's it. website, that there's under the photo section a, uh, a file that consists of pictures of that SAQ Alexanderson station in Sweden. Grimmerton? Yeah, that the uh, Grimmerton, yeah. That's the one. And there, here you'll find. That's it in real uh, life. Yep. It's eight feet in diameter by six feet in length. Uh, that's just concerning the coil portion. And the conductors are 300,000 circular mill lit wire. So that's a load of copper there. Right. And then the calculated uh, quarter wavelength frequency. Uh, I guess uh, compensating for burden factor and what have you, this coil would have operated at around 130 or so kilocycles, give or take. So it doesn't operate in resonance with the actual transmission structure, which is wanted. Otherwise, it would wreak havoc. Yeah, that, that would be the Tesla frequency, but the uh, the operating frequency in this case is 17. I believe 17.6 or 17.8 right. kilocycles. But if you took that coil and separated it off and, and fed it as a pi over two network, it would it would be a Tesla transformer at about 100 kilocycles. So it would be one very powerful Tesla transformer. So basically that's where we're going with this. We're not we're not really trying to build an Alexanderson system, even though it'd be nice to. But uh, but right now we're mainly after uh, the uh, the Tesla mode of transmission. But uh, but I will say that the Alexanderson mode of transmission is something that needs to be more thoroughly studied. It's definitely the only valid uh, uh, non patent infringing improvement on the work of Nikola Tesla. So again, this is on ericpdollar.com. Click on photos, and then there's the link for the uh, Sweden site, and that's where you can see all the pictures. Um, can we keep scrolling through these? Or that looks familiar. That looks familiar, huh? It's out yeah. of some of the diagrams from uh, Power of Ether. Yeah, that's the uh, double log periodic uh, golden ratio antenna. That's for HF. Every hammer oh, like to have oh. one of these in his backyard. Keep scrolling, or you, you had some comments, Griffin, or more on the telluric stuff? Or? Uh, that's pretty much done with me. So I believe okay. that Adrian and Bruce Gavin were working on some recent telluric experiments from what I've been observing. 
perhaps if they wanted to share anything. Okay, and you want me to save these other ones for after this topic, or? Sure. Well, I guess when we get to the personal uh, personal research okay. section. Okay. I think Bruce is on here somewhere. Um, Bruce, do you have any comments that you want to throw in on the subject? No, kids walking with this thing. Hello. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, there you are. Okay. Um, well, I've, I've been playing around with a couple of uh, uh, observations on, on uh, running a uh, Tesla transformer down on a 160 meter band. And I've, I've set up a beacon, a CW beacon, and uh, took reports back uh, from stations running conventional antennas and got some interesting results. It oh, went from uh, distances out. Now, the, the, uh, the small Tesla transformers about um, maybe four feet off the ground, 15 inches in diameter. It's just a two coil system. It's fed against a ground plane. The, uh, and I was running approximately uh, um, 90 watts of power into the primary winding. And I was, I've got reports back from 175 miles to 350 miles out with, uh, you know, uh, various signal levels coming from various receivers so that the, uh, you know, there's no standard involved and there's no standard antenna of course, but it, it did, you know, it was readable signals. And uh, there was but one particular station that was, that I had communicated with a conventional antenna. And based on what he was seeing uh, with the signal that was coming out of the beacon from the Tesla transformer, it, it, the Tesla transformer with that given power level was probably about 10 dB down below what the uh, conventional antenna would have done. <clears throat> so anyway, um, some observations. And I, I think what's going on here is, uh, you know, conventional ionic uh, waves. Uh, uh, there was uh, <clears throat> some observations I made with a, a uh, SDR uh, receiver that was, that I would, that I'd logged into over the internet, listening to the beacon and uh, it, as the sun rose the, and the, the, the morning progressed, it, it, um, the signal faded out. So, um, you know, it's a, the D-level absorption is taking place. Uh, so anyway, it's just preliminary and it's, uh, you know, getting some results uh, and making some, some uh, you know, some signal pass complete, which is interesting. So I'll be running, a, I'll be doing a little more with this and trying to, Maybe improve on the the um, the winding of the of the coil and do some experiments with the secondary coil configured a little differently. I guess I guess that's about it from here. Okay. Any com I'll, comments, Adrian? Yeah, I'll just add on the on the telluric work. Um, I've been looking at the difference between the three coil and a two coil system. So by three coil, I'm referring to primary, secondary and extra coil. Um, at the moment, I'm not seeing any great improvement um, for the three coil system over the two coil over over telluric short range. So I have an arrangement between um, two um, <coughs> two outbuildings um, that I have at my lab um, where I have uh, the uh, transmitter and I have the receiver at a distance um, there, and I can do a comparison between a single wire um, between the two and a telluric connection, a good, a very well grounded um, um, telluric system between the two. So I can compare, I can pair them directly. And I previously done quite a lot of experiments on on this with a two coil. Uh, you can find those on my website. They're written up in a lot of detail. Um, along with the results and the amount of power that was transferred. And the three-coil system, um, I'm looking to see whether there's any difference. At the moment, 
Um, it's very preliminary. Um, I need to um, take a lot more measurements, um, but I'm not seeing any any great advantage um, at the moment from just preliminary trials. But that is work in progress. Um, um, in terms of the between the UK and the US, um, we haven't progressed any further with experiments. I think there is a general um, consideration that. From the point of view of telluric um, transmission, uh, 160 meters um, doesn't really um, um, travel through the earth in the telluric, um, what we would consider to be a telluric mode. Um, the frequency is way too high. So I would imagine that we need to go to a much lower frequency. Um, I would think that hundreds of killer cycles will still be way too much. Um, I've tried experiments down to 900 kilocycles. Um, I suspect we'll probably have to go much lower than that, um, maybe down to 20, 25 kilocycles, um, if we're going to really see anything with that, even at close range. But those are those are speculations at the moment. They are they are steps still to be taken. Um, so that's that's everything from my perspective so far with the telluric i think i think what bruce was also sharing that was quite hot off the press and it was that's a quite an interesting experiment um i'm hoping bruce that we'll also be able to get a the receiver will also be able to be a um a tesla transformer that might be quite an interesting experiment with the with both the transmitter and the receiver as reciprocal um, tesla transformers so i'm looking forward to seeing bruce's progress on that as well but that's everything for me, Aaron, on telluric stuff. You're on mute, Aaron. Anything you want to add on that, to that, Griffin? Mm, no, nothing okay. really. Okay, you want me to go, go into the uh, other pictures? Mm, sure. Is that okay. Okay, let's see. I guess this will uh, venture into the uh, outer realm research. I guess individualized, personalized forms of research. Uh, so, is this the first image in this slideshow? I believe that there was a. Okay, so right, right out. One. Yeah, right after the uh, coil. Oh, okay. Form, we, then it just we could go this. to the one with the discs. Yeah, and there the, was one that was blank. So I don't know if you uploaded one and it glitched out, but it's uh, okay. there's, there's a blank one. Well, so we can start it? off with the one at the very left. At the very the left. Discs. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> that one. Okay, so. In the two previous live calls, there's been talk from myself and also uh, Hawkes, who's not here, who spoke on my behalf, in regards to uh, certain high-frequency work involving the Tesla radiant matter tube. Now, without getting into the description of the tube as it was already done in the previous calls, I'll start off with an interesting observation which has been occurring with these tubes. Now, granted that these devices possess a single electrode, uh, usually composed of a lightweight metal, such as aluminum, in this case, that by action of the high frequency current supplied to the lamps, that there seems to be a very interesting corrosion that almost seems to resemble a thermal attacking of the aluminum. But what becomes interesting is that there's a specific spot of attack that does not look to be of conventional corrosive effects, if that makes sense. Now, this is a zoomed in picture of the electrode in question taken out of one of the arbitrary lamps, and we can see that it's severely attacked. Now, this electrode measures about one inch in diameter and is about an eighth of an inch in thickness, nothing special. Uh, consists of it. It's simply a highly polished disc, which has been subjected to the plasma formations within inside these tubes and also the rays emanating from them. Now, uh, we could go to the next picture. Now, the same electrode observed on the backside of it does not resemble the same attacked formations on the other side. This is the backside, and that small square connects to it the lead-in wire to the tube. Now, of course, the question begs itself as to what is going on. 
inside this peculiar but rather simplistic tube? Why is it being attacked on one side but the other side it's not? And exactly what characteristics are forming on this electrode? Now, of course, uh, my current means and resources do not allow me to physically analyze the metallurgical compounds associated with this electrode. So recently, I was able to send this to a test lab in Portland, Oregon, who will be able to study this in further depth and do elemental analysis on this because what's hypothesized and sounds a bit out of reach, or I guess far-fetched, is that the actions which are occurring within these lamps and other uh, similar replica lamps, which uh, Tesla was able to venture upon, that there may be a possible elemental transmutation, so to speak, that could be manifesting itself on these lamps, but also within the inner wall of the glass. So, of course, that question remains up in the air, and that's why this test lab will hopefully shed some light on what's occurring within this tube. Now, uh, speaking on behalf of Hawkes, says, who's not here, that the research which he's been conducting in terms of replicating the experiments I've been doing, that we've considered and come to the relative conclusion that what is being produced by these tubes, the electrostatic action, they seem to represent the characteristics of beta particles, or in the academia's uh, point of view, high energy electrons based upon the uh, penetration into metals, what have you, and the relative distances which the rays can be detected as far. So thus far, uh, I, sh I must mention, and I have uh, stated in previous live calls, that the rays which emanate from these tubes are rather curious and display some interesting characteristics to that of conventional rays used in, used in the medical field. But what remains a rather interesting characteristic is that based off uh, upon various organic experiments upon organisms and what have you, that these rays do not seem to impinge any negative effect thus far observed upon organisms. So it could be deduced to some extent, of course, uh, by scientific means, not completely, that these rays or particles being projected from the tube display a unique phenomenon that hasn't really been seen since Tesla's time and up until now has really been seen rigorous scientific research. So, of course, that gets into the other realm of uh, this tube research and the, I guess, the unfolding endless research is associated with it. So that's one thing I wanted to point out with it, that this electrode is, as we speak, likely is going under some rigorous elemental analysis of metallurgical proportion just to see what exactly is going on with that. And aside with the other research involving other high tension transformers and replicas, uh, that will remain itself for another live call, I suppose. The next pictures. Oh, okay. Well, if we have time. Sure. Okay. Well, I guess we could cover it. Okay. There's the next one. Okay. So in, in correlation with uh, the rays emanating off the tube, uh, this is, aside from it, this is actually an experimental receiving tube, which I've devised. Now, the question as to detecting the rays emanating off the tube as to how do we harness it, or I guess, how do we quantify it? So taking into consideration what is called the rotating brush effect, which Tesla observed and which I finally observed and is uh, seen on my YouTube channel, is that by taking into consideration that effect and the manipulation of low vacuum plasma within inside a glass chamber, this experimental receiving or detector lamp was devised so that to make use of it. Now it is energized by high frequency, the center electrode, which is a thin wire and has two capacitive plates on either side. Now, once this plasma is actuated by high frequency currents, it could be easily manipulated with a surrounding magnetic field. And of course, this field, which is connected to a coil not shown in this picture, may be connected to electrostatic plates at some distance. Away, And from what I've noticed is that the rays projected off the radiant matter tube 
will impact these plates and induce a current, so to speak, within this pickup coil, which would otherwise manipulate the plasma within inside this tube. And by having a detecting apparatus connected to the electrodes on beside the center electrode of this lamp, it is possible to quantify the effects at a distance of the projecting rays. Now, this is very tentative, and this is an extremely rough prototype what could be accomplished in terms of receiving receiving apparatuses. But of course, uh, this is the very first step in terms of quantifying the rays being projected forth. Now, I won't get into this too often. I mean, um, in too much of depth. So we could probably move on to the next pictures, which coincide with this research. Hmm. Oh, next picture. Next. <laughs> yes. So uh, some may know the uh, lecture that Nikola Tesla gave in 1892 before the London Electrical Engineers. Uh, I believe it was 1892, 1891. depends on when the book was published. And in that, he disclosed some very interesting transformer designs. And what stands out about these designs, and this is the replica or a construction of one that's being constructed as we speak, is that these disruptive discharge apparatuses work in the very low frequency range of 10 to 20 kilocycles, which does not seem to be commonplace in the realm of a typical spark-hungry Tesla coil or builders of the modern era. So this is one example of one of the apparatuses which Tesla was constructed. Now, if you go to the previous picture, prior to this one, let's see if you could move to the previous picture. That, there we go. Oh, next one. That, that we see uh, two pancake coils, which are wound consecutively and have multiple layers. Now, this is a technique which Tesla devised to obtain very low frequencies, but at the time were considered high frequency, and ultimately allow for the experimenter to obtain high tensions, or I guess what Tesla described as pressures, to any acceptable, uh, acceptable degree. Now, what's unique about this arrangement, and which is shown in the picture after this, is that these two coils are connected in tandem and are wound oppositely which create uh, effectively a null or phase cancellation in between the connection of the secondaries. And what it allows this apparatus to do or accomplish is to effectively operate it in a push-pull scenario. So as Tesla devised, uh, this transformer could be operated with disruptive discharge currents, but as what Eric is proposing and which will be conceived of shortly, is to use a hydrogen thyrotron vacuum drive system, which also operates in push-pull. And this will effectively drive these coils at very low frequencies, comparatively anywhere from 10 to, say, 40 kilocycles, which would otherwise give some astounding effects not before observed necessarily since Tesla's time, because it seems as though that these plasma effects really relate to in terms of frequency as well as potential. So that's what's going to be developed and researched thoroughly within the next couple of months. And that development will be presented in one of my presentations at this conference. And that's the general perspective of this arrangement. I guess we could go fast forward to the next couple of pictures. <clears throat> and this is another replica of what is known as the classical Tesla oil field transformer. It comprises a similar design as opposed to the previous design, which was encased in paraffin. But in this case, this was one of uh, Tesla's early designs. It essentially a 24 uh, centimeter square box that houses a coil apparatus encased in mineral oil or paraffin oil. And we could see that the two binding posts uh, farthest to the left and right hand sides, those connect to the secondary windings and the four posts in the center connect to the primary windings. 
of the setup. Now, what's quite peculiar about this design, which does show a very early conception of high frequency oscillator as designed by Tesla, which could be seen in the next picture, is that the primary winding of the coil is not located on the outside or the skirt of the secondary. It is in fact wound on the inside of the secondary. And likewise, as I've said prior, that the secondary connection is made over the primary where there's essentially a phase cancellation that allows for a connection without any arcing or what have you to go from the primary to the secondary. So this makes use of this phase cancellation and to the exact specifications which Tesla disclosed in that lecture, I've been able to construct a replica as shown before you in which rather than using, I, I suppose, 19th century materials, including hard rubber, we go for a more efficient approach in this case with more dielectrically efficient polyethylene plastics, which are as rigid as hard rubber, but pose a greater efficiency in terms of uh, dielectric field line absorption and what have you. But other than that, it's the exact same thing and should likely operate within the same frequency range, within only the tens of kilocycle range. And this should lend itself to some peculiar plasma effects and what have you, which will be observed and recorded within the next couple of weeks. And this is only a snippet of what's going on thus far. So let's see if there aren't any other pictures. I believe that would pretty much sum it up from my point of view. Yeah, that's that's okay. the last of them. Yep. So that's pretty much what's going on. And are you bringing some of that to the conference to show and demonstrate, or likely the paraffin <laughs> oscillator? Because I'm hesitant on bringing or sending over the air a uh, oil-filled box, as <laughs> it is hermetically sealed. But <laughs> I mean, should anything happen, I I wouldn't want three gallons of mineral oil to uh, take a nasty spill. <laughs> okay. So possibly. Well, we'll mm -hmm. see. Okay. Um, any other comments, Eric? Or no, not directly. Even though this uh, this reconstruction of the original Tesla coil is going to be really interesting, and and figuring out how to do this with hydrogen thyrotrons rather than the very difficult to duplicate uh, mercury, uh, high-speed mercury switch, which I think thus far nobody has duplicated. Uh, if we can go from that to hydrogen thyrotrons, that'll make things a lot easier, even though it would be preferable to make everything the way Tesla made it. But that mercury switch is, uh, that's a rough one. T Tesla actually had some company in Germany that specially made these things for him. And you can see them in a, in a lot of his uh, his early apparatus once you know what they are. So we're going to try to start off with a pair of 3C45 hydrogen thyrotrons, and um, hopefully they're fast enough to uh, to do this. I know it shouldn't be a problem to 10 kilocycles, but uh, 30 might be a little rough. Uh, they the main engineering complication is going to be on the uh, the oscillator driver for the thyrotrons. That's uh, going to be a real reenactment of World War II radar technology, something that I'm very good at. But uh, but nevertheless, I still have to design all this. So so we'll see how it works. Uh, of course, you know we can easily start off with just regular sine waves, but um, and you know, crude rotary switches, but uh, in order to really do this right, the, the switching rate should be the same as the uh, frequency. And uh, hard vacuum tubes just don't uh, turn on hard enough. So we've got to figure out how to do this with the, with the thyrotrons, which fortunately are still readily available for a fairly decent price. How much, how much longer that will last, I don't know. Uh, the um, the driver and uh, pulse forming end of it will use a pretty common tube, 6SN7, 
but uh, those are very popular in the music industry. And most of those are made in Russia. So with the new uh, conflagration going on with Russia and all the rest of that garbage, that's just going to make all this uh, even more difficult now. But we'll see how far that goes. There's a bunch of other things going on, too. I don't know. Do you have anything to present on the, the Telerik uh, receiving audio amplifier, Griffin? Right. So... I do not include any pictures just yet um, because the file size exceeded its maximum capability. But essentially what Eric is describing is a couple month long venture so far into the development of a suburban seismic forecasting system, which makes use of a very unique amplification design as uh, put forward by Eric. It uses what are known as telephone repeating coils. Uh, that's only part of its construction, but it essentially uses military vacuum tubes, which will facilitate a ultra low frequency amplification so that to rid of any local mad main interference, which would then be supplied to uh, frequency selective voltmeters or other frequency receiving apparatuses and effectively be recorded or the output of those receivers being recorded on chart paper. Now, I have a video from a couple months ago on my YouTube channel detailing the preliminary construction of the seismic racks, which I have right now in the lab. One is dedicated to the seismic receiving equipment, chart recorders and what have you, and the other one dedicated to the radio frequency source and reception so that to broadca uh, eventually broadcast this uh, information and these measurements on the airwaves on some type of continuous basis. So it is a very tedious project. It is requiring uh, many resources and what have you, but essentially the amplifier has been completed. I do not have any photos to share at the moment right now, but I will be posting fairly shortly some detailed pictures of the chassis of the units and the rack mounted pieces of equipment. So this, this uh, design of amplifier is, is shown in a lengthy presentation I gave called the musical seismograph, which gets into the, uh, the philosophy and the particular designs of the amplifiers. And it does have a, a possible commercial value for um, audio, regular audio amplification. Uh, the one problem with receiving the telluric signals, which I struggled with for a decade at Landers, particularly back when there used to be a lot more interference through the Navy and navigational signals, is, um, is trying to get these signals through an amplifier is uh, quite a challenge. And uh, because the amplifier tends to want to make signals of its own when you start beating real heavy on it, and uh, when you have anything, you know, that's got an antenna that occupies, like in the situation here, 4,800 feet of uh, space out there in the field, you can get some pretty nasty impulses. And these things have to get through the amplifier without causing it to choke. Uh, in Griffin's case, uh, his uh, aerial uh, seismic receiving antenna is really not more, much more than an aerial capacitance. It's a uh, very small Marconi flat top and uh, its impedance is undefined. So it's uh, strictly electrostatic. So the, the, the main purpose of the so-called amplifier at this point is to convert from electrostatic to electromagnetic. So, the input impedance of the amplifier will be what's called bridging. In other words, the input impedance of the amplifier will be so high that it won't burden the uh, won't burden the electrostatic antenna. In other words, the amplifier, for all practical purposes, will pull no current, but it will deliver a substantial current. So it's a uh, very special design that I have come up with. That's a modified cathode follower beating a modified grounded grid stage. Uh, amplification in this uh, type of sense is no longer thinking of voltage amplification or voltage amplification has no meaning. 
Uh, I get into this detail in the musical seismograph video is its power amplification. The cathode follower puts out less voltage on the output side than it gets on the input side, but the power level is much greater. So basically, then the output of the amplifier has a conventional either you know 150 ohm uh, balanced or six or 50 ohm unbalanced, which in this case then go into uh, conventional measuring instruments, which you cannot hook straight to the antenna because their low impedance would just basically short it out. So, so Griffin has already done a lot of experimentation with this antenna pair. Uh, one is a bipolar underground and an, the other one is a monopolar overground. And now the thing is to get the proper input amplifiers or converters more properly built and then to get these things into uh, recording instruments in whatever band of frequencies we're going to use, which depends on the interference. Fortunately, uh, because of the engineering uh, dominance of the city of Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, which is strictly Delta Delta, uh, all of the um, municipally owned utility companies in Los Angeles County are Delta Delta. And uh, so Griffin is very lucky to be in a, an area free of all the zero sequence harmonic hash. And also what's unique is uh, He's in a completely dielectric geological area, which might allow for some interesting transmissions and receptions that would not be possible uh, in other locations. So the Alexanderson antenna and the beverage antenna do not like good grounds. They, they actually prefer just to have a pure capacitance. So, so he's kind of really in the right spot for that. And um, once this thing is finished, uh, there will be then in that neighborhood a seismic uh, advanced warning system uh, workable that uh, should give 18 hours uh, forewarning of any disaster level earthquake in that area. So it's about time we finally get something together. None of the experts or the authorities or the masters or the what have you of this whole area have even scratched the surface, even though they've expended untold kilowatt hours crowing and uh, making noise about it. Uh, this will be basically a, a micro version of what I have built at Landers. Uh, I do want to point out that the, uh, the seismic forecasting really is the dominant EPD laboratories project, but the, uh, to get the necessary funding and cooperation to terminate the mine Put the seismographs up and all that is beyond what I can afford and, uh, and what have you. And I don't know how to overcome this, but I regard it as uh, an absolutely ridiculous tragedy that I have this incredible seismic facility bored into a mountain somewhere ready to be hooked up. And I can't get the goddamn uh, doorway and entrance and, you know, the portal built so that I can start to plug in and get this stuff out. But uh, but anyway, I'm doing what I can, and at least I can get some of the radio frequency or, or high frequency, whatever you want to call it, the ionospheric stuff, into the cable TV shack and get something. At least I can get something started here. But um, again, uh, that work episode is supposed to be in May. Uh, the the Alexanderson coil uh, after this model is built, then. The objective is either to get down to 60 kilocycles for the uh, low frequency WWV, or possibly uh, it would be a rather large uh, unit, but get down to the 24.9 uh, kilocycle, maybe two megawatt uh, transmitter in Jim Creek, Washington which uh, normally is pestilent and jams out all your seismic and telluric stuff. But in this case, uh, because it's readily available and it's so powerful, um, we might get, be able to get down to that level and, uh, and see how many uh, milliwatts we can get locally out of it. That, that's kind of the way this particular telluric episode is gonna be approached. We're basically gonna try to receive signals that are already being sent. That makes things a lot easier. And, uh, and get down as low frequency as we possibly, you know, can economically afford. So 
then uh, hopefully during this interval, the uh, the electronics will be completed and the cable TV shack and the antennas will be up. I estimate that uh, that this episode will cost, uh, we'll need about $5,000 of donations minimum. So I hope that comes in and we can uh, move forward because uh, what's fortunate it is, is, uh, is we have all the people free during that interval to work on this stuff and the amount of pay that various uh, technical people are asking to assist with this is very minimal. So it would be a tragedy if we can't get the money to do this because it's going to be a big push forward. So that kind of wraps up what I have to say about this. Okay. So here again is um, how uh, anybody who's able to offer some financial support, uh, ericpdollar.com forward slash donate. And this page right here has the details on um, how to donate by check or money order. And you can see that the money is going to um, this research. So it is going to good use. Uh, checks and money orders can be written to uh, EPD Laboratories, Inc. and sent to this address in Spokane. And then I endorse the check and I send it down to uh, the bank in Nevada. And that's that's what supports all the work going uh, down there. Uh, also, there's a donate link here. And again, when you click that, uh, well, let me go ahead and click it right now. Um, there's an option to click this checkbox right here. So if you put in $10, you have an option to have $10 automatically being donated every month. Um, you know, it all adds up and, and every bit helps. And you can see that the uh, the donations uh, absolutely go to what they're supposed to. Um, so that's for the uh, Eric is talking about the project in uh, uh, May uh, down there in Nevada uh, for April. Um, if anybody's able to donate any, that would help us out for the uh, the uh, April uh, episode up here at my shop. Uh, any of the parts and and other stuff that's that's paid for out of my pocket, and I'm already pr pretty financially heavily invested in all the project anyway. So there's there's a lot of money coming out of my pocket for quite a bit of this. Um, but if uh, anybody's able to make any donations, that would that would help because there are food costs and lodging and travel and, and all that kind of thing. Um, also, Griffin has a website. Uh, let me put this in real quick. And you can see that Griffin obviously is putting uh, any kind of donations and financial support into the experiments. Uh, his website is griffingbrock.com. He also has a PayPal donate link, and he has his uh, a lot of the experiments posted in his blog posts here that you can kind of see that uh, so, so, some of this is posted over on Eric's page. But uh, he's kind of Griffin's keeping a journal of his experiments and the results, and a lot of this will be shared in more depth on the uh, uh, at the conference, and then also Dr. Adrian Marsh, uh, AM dash innovations.com. Uh, this is a resource with a lot of the work that's exactly related to everything we just talked about on the call. Uh, there's also a, uh, there's a GoFundMe and a, a PayPal link, and that helps him with, uh, you know, doing these experiments over in the UK, uh, but definitely short term, uh, going to the uh, ericpdollar.com forward slash donate, that would help us the most with uh, both the projects going on in April and May. And again, uh, if you plan on coming to the conference, which is July 5th through the 9th uh, here in Spokane, Washington, it'll be five days jam packed with about 16, 17 presenters, about 20 presentations uh, here in Spokane, Washington. The uh, in-person tickets, uh, almost 50 percent of them already sold out and we got almost four months left. Uh, so they're going quick. We're limiting it to uh, 60 or 65 people at the shop. Uh, so there's 36 tickets left. If you want to, you know, come and visit us, see these demonstrations in person, uh, meet all of us, um, network and, uh, uh, and this conference will be at my shop. We had it at my shop last year. We're going to have it at the shop again this year. I'm already paying a lot of rent there. My overhead is kind of high, so I'm not going to pay a hotel room to turn, turn around and haul everything to a different place to show it when we can just do it right there. Plus, I can set up and tear down on my own terms instead of theirs. And uh, but that's where it happens. And it seemed everybody was pretty, uh, pretty happy with how the conference turned out. Plus, doing it at the shop there, that's you're actually 
at the conference in the place where this kind of stuff happens. So <laughs> it's uh, kind of gives you the underground feel. So come to the underground. <laughs> That's uh, energyscienceconference.com. And uh, on the homepage, you can come down here and click click one of these buttons for get the tickets. That'll take you to emediapress.com. Or the shortcut is emediapress.com forward slash conference. And that'll take you to the same page right here. Uh, and you can scroll down. And if you want to come in person, you can get one of the 36 tickets left on this side. Or if you're interested in streaming because you can't make the trip, uh, you can click this one over here. And I think there's a, a discount on the live streaming tickets uh, until possibly the end of this month. I don't know if that expired yet or not. It's only $175. For the ticket, that's unlimited streaming access to all five days, all presentations. There's uh, 46 streaming tickets uh, remaining. Um, $175 is nothing for something like that. People pay several thousand dollars just to come in person and hang out for a week. So to do this for under 200 bucks, there's a chance right now. And then I think maybe af after the end of this month, possibly, then it's going up to $225. Um, let's see. Should we go ahead and maybe open up for questions, Eric? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, go Alan, ahead. I have, yeah. I still have an update um, for you. Yeah, go for it. Okay. So, much of my uh, work at the moment is um, continuing with the what I've called the Will Work of Nature series of experiments. I mean, you can find those on my website. Um, there are already some very large write ups there on the experiments. Um, but that series of experiments is aimed to uh, look at fundamental fundamental tesla phenomena and where they might come from um and that's um also aligned with um um what eric originally discovered with the golden ratio discharge back in 1978 i've rediscovered that um and continued that experimentation so i'm going to be presenting in a lot of detail on the golden ratio discharge at the conference and this picture um, you're seeing here is the is the beginning of the development of the of a additional generator that I'm going to bring with me to the conference. This is going to be another in the suitcase job, like I did last year. Um, but it's um, this is this is based on a GU five B, um, a Russian GU five B, and that is a beast of a power child. Um, it's small and compact, but it can it can push about three and a half kilowatts if you if you really pump it hard. Um, but its big advantage is like unlike many tubes like the the eight thirty three C, it can it's specified for five kilovolts maximum anode um, potential, but you can push it a lot higher than that. So with a Joe uh, with, with a low duty cycle or or, or impulse. Um, driver you can drive that up to about nine kilovolts um, um for for uh, very small duty cycle and that makes it very good um for this kind of uh discharge experiment um much of the work that i've done on my website is uh uses the gu5b or the 833c um also the 3500 um z um zg um those two other tubes, the 833C and the 3500Z and the 4250, they, they'll, they'll start to flash over if you, um, so you'll get flash over between the anode and the grid. Um, if you try to push them up as far as this one. So this is a very good tube, um, um, for this kind of experiment. It does require quite a lot of infrastructure. So it, it has about a 350 VA heater requirement just for a single tube. So there you can see the big toroidal transformer. Um, that's also, of course, 240, 120 volt um, transformer. Um, because in the UK, I'm going to run it off 240. And in America, I'm going to run it off 120. I know Aaron has 220 in the shop as well, which is good. Um, you can also see the, um, um, at the bottom there, you're starting to get some of the, some of the high voltage, um, bias. Um, this is going to run. This is going to run as a Class C Armstrong oscillator, and I will explain why I'm using that um, in a lot of detail um, at the um, at the conference, and its comparisons to things like a push pull um, driver, 
um, and a single tail double tube as well. So I'm going to be going in a lot of detail into the difference with these generators because the main theme of what I'm going to be showing is, is where does this, what part of the system um, leads to seeing this kind of discharge? So in other words, is it from the generator? Is it from uh, the, the, the characteristics of the coil? Um, is it from the environment? Or is it some combination of those things? And I'm going to be going into a lot of detail of that um, in my presentation. So this is part of the preparation for that. Um, there you can see it start, started coming together. Um, this is built in um, uh, PDFE, uh, 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 PTFE and um, HDPE. I, I gave HDP a try um, um, out, and those two side panels are made from HDPE. Um, but the um, structure actually supporting the tube, um, that's PTFE. It needs to be it needs to be able to cope with some fairly high temperatures on the anode. So that's where the generator is currently at. Um, now this is. Um, something that I put together recently. Um, it's a it's a very high voltage differential probe. So um, part of what I want to show is I want to show the actual drive waveforms that are actually um, that are actually um, going on in the coil, and this is good. So the large silver um, structures at the top they are hundred mega ohm, um, 40, 40 kilovolts each. Um, so, and that, that goes down onto a, onto a differential six and a half kilovolt differential probe. So you can run this, you can run this up to about 65 kilovolts, um, differential. Um, um, and that is more than adequate, um, to be able to actually, um, look at the drive waveforms that are actually going on because, when when it's oscillating, um, and especially when you're using it in burst mode, um, so in other words, you're just bursting the oscillation um, for very short periods, very short duty cycles. The um, the voltages can reach up to twelve kilovolts, uh, twelve to fifteen kilovolts across the across the primary. So it becomes very difficult to measure those waveforms directly. Um, but this is capable of doing it. So it's it's largely it's again it's it's HDPE um, constructed. Um, there's another shot of it. Um, those actually the silver um, high voltage um, probes there. They actually come out of the Tektronix um, P6015, which is a forty kilovolt high frequency probe. Um, so this is good. This is good as I said to about sixty five kilovolts up to about twenty megacycles. Um, it's also powered by battery, so it's completely isolated um, from from the the live system, um, and that's also pretty important for the test equipment um, as well. Um, modern test equipment or even um, um, vintage test equipment doesn't take well to those kinds of voltages and currents. So here's a here's part of the setup. Now the other part of what I'm doing is. Um, is high speed photography. This is something that Eric and I have been talking about for a while now, about looking at the capacitive growth of these discharges, um, and that's. So I've been looking at doing slow motion um, work. Again, I'm going to be presenting a lot of this at the um, at the um, at the conference. Um, that is a Sony RX10 Mark II um, slow motion camera. Um, which can take down to 1,000 frames per second. So that's able to capture a time slice of one millisecond um, on, on the discharge. Um, then obviously you're playing that video at 25 frames a second, so it's about 40, 40 times slower. Now, I've also found a way to reduce that by another factor of 100 to get it 4,000 times slower. So... There you actually start to see the uh, at, at four thousand times you actually start to see the the growth of the discharge um, as it as as it bursts out um, of the um, of the top of the electrode. Um, I'm going to be I'm, this is work in progress at the moment. 
Um, there's a lot of editing. I mean, two second bursts turns into turns into one and a half hours at forty times, um, and then slowing down portions of that by four thousand times, uh, up to four thousand times slower. Really, I think if you're going to really see the full growth of the of the fractal fern or golden ratio discharge, you need about ten thousand times camera. Uh, but you're also looking at about fifty thousand US dollars for a, for a ten thousand frame. Um, a second um, 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 camera. So this is a good start. Um, and it will certainly show us some very interesting um, results in terms of the growth of the golden ratio discharge. Um, so that'll also be at the conference. Uh, let me hang on a minute. What have I gone? Right. Okay, so here, here, is the, here is the experimental setup um, running. Uh, you can see you get that nice, nice golden ratio discharge off the top. That's a single GU5B driving that at about 2.8 megacycles. Um, the you can see there the, the 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 high voltage probe that I was showing you before is connected directly into the system, and that is connected to a to a Hewlett Packard 5452C. Um, um, four channel, five hundred megacycle um, um, oscilloscope. Now you need to use that kind of. Uh, I, I've, I like this HP stuff out of the nineties because when you put it next to a high power Tesla coil, it, it just doesn't mind. Um, most uh, most 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 modern equipment, when you push that thing up to four or five kilowatts, um, it just it just doesn't work at all. So that era of of of, of test equipment is really good if you want to get down into into the nitty gritty of the of, of the voltage um, and the and the current that's uh, profile that's actually going on across that um, uh, that's coming out of the generator and is actually across the primary coil. So there's another shot. Uh, we're getting those discharge. We're getting those discharges in slow motion as well. Okay, so this shows the whole setup um, that I'm using at the moment. So, on from left to right, um, you've got the, the the tuning unit. I will be bringing that unit with me um, to um, ESTC this year um, because I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be using a number of different coils. This is just one coil, um, but I will be uh, that allows for interchangeable coils, which lead to different characteristics and different properties. So I'm going to show you where the golden ratio discharge stops being a golden ratio discharge and starts being a normal type of discharge that you would get um, uh, uh, off of any standard Tesla coil. I'm going to show you the transition between that. I'm going to show you the characteristics that are needed for that transition. And ultimately, we're going to boil down to what are the necessary set of fundamental characteristics that leads to this kind of discharge. That's that's what we're going to be covering at the conference. So we have the the, the tuning unit on the left. Um, next to that is the pickup coil um, on the very far left. That is a twenty turn selectable, so you can select it turn by turn, which is pretty important to get the to get the tube oscillating exactly where you want it. Um, it allows very fine adjustment of the feedback. Um, the unit in the middle is the GU5B unit. That's my my original unit, and that I have in the in the in the lab. Um, I'm going to be bringing a much smaller unit, um, which I'm which I showed you at the beginning that I'm making. Um, that will be one that fits in my case. Um, and then on the right there, we have on top of the uh, under the oscilloscope. Sorry, we have the um, the high tension supply um that also is quite a powerful supply um that can that can go up to 10 kilovolts at about four kilowatts um and in a number of different ways so it can be driven um um uh, it can be bridge rectified it can be doubled or level shifted um it can be um um uh, half wave rectified or just 
the direct um, um, output. So it's very flexible in how it can be configured. And that also um, leads to a number of different interesting effects with the discharge as well, depending on the drive, uh, of, on the of the generator drive. And I'm going to be going into that in detail as well. Um, here I've also got, you can see in the middle of picture, um, maybe you see it better there, there, that's a Tektronics um, current probe, 50 amp um, current probe, which um, allows me, so now I can measure, I can really measure across the actual primary coil itself, voltage and the current profile. So we see what that coil is being driven with. What is the actual waveform? And what's very interesting is you find that the, the, um, for the golden ratio discharge to emerge, you need the, uh, um, voltage profile or the, um, the oscillating sine wave, let's call it. It's not a pure sine wave by any means. Um, you're running that at about 2.8 megacycles, and you see the current. The current waveform is is almost three times that. So you need to have a th this interplay between um, the voltage and the current um, waveforms um, lead to the type of discharge that you're getting. Um, and I'm, again, I'm going to go that, into that in more detail. So. There is the there is the Tektronics um, current probe amplifier that connects to the oscilloscope as well, um, and then you can measure both voltage and current directly as you actually run in the system, as you tune it, as you adjust it, and that, and then as you add different coils to it, um, that gives you the full scope. And I have coils. I think you can see them in one of the picture there. On the on on the shelf at the top of the picture, there is a number of different coils. Um, those are already all written up on my website, but they span from two point eight megacycles down to about three hundred and fifty kilocycles, and in steps. So you can go from say about two point eight megacycles down to one megacycle, down to um, five hundred kilocycles, and there you see very big changes um, in the in the in the in the form of the discharge, um, and particularly the transition. So when it stops being a golden ratio or fractal fern discharge, when it starts being a conventional um, discharge that you would get off of a VTTC, so a vacuum tube Tesla coil, of which there are thousands and thousands on the um, on the um, on YouTube um, that you can see. Generally, you get um, um, a normal VTTC just produces like a swords discharge. There are lots of straight streamers going up into the air, um, which are very different from this kind of discharge. There you've got two. In that picture, you've got two streamers actually winding around each other um, as they come out at the top. I don't know if I can zoom this. Maybe I, maybe I can. Uh, yeah, I can. So there you've got two two streamers actually winding around them each other um, before they that they branch out at the top. So altogether, putting it all together in ESTC, I'm going to be going over all these properties, all these qualities. I'm going to be showing what are the core um, set of requirements to actually generate this kind of discharge and what makes the difference and what doesn't make the difference. Um, and for example, why you don't see this on the thousands of, um, of Tesla calls that are made out there on the internet. Um, so that's where things are at. Um, it's work in progress. Um, uh, some of this stuff is going into the presentation. Some of it, um, I don't have time to release the latest stuff onto the website at the moment, but that will be coming along, um, probably after ESTC. I will I will um, um, update those write ups and put the new experiments on the website. But until then, this is the this is this is the the latest work, and we'll continue when I get back from America. Um, I will finish I will finish this experimentation um, um, in preparation for what we do at ESTC. Great, thank you, Aaron. That's everything okay, from me. Awesome, thank you. Okay.
Yeah, I got a few things to add. Okay, go for it. So my work with all this has not been a self-oscillating system, but it's been an externally derived frequency that's adjustable. And of course, I always use a balanced coil configuration because I don't want the thing to transmit and get into the test equipment. And particularly when you start getting up to the higher power levels, all of a sudden you end up with some kind of electromagnetic terrorist apparatus, which is not a good thing to have in today's political environment. But, uh, but here's what I observed is uh, the shape of the discharge is when your os oscillator is tuned precisely to the resonant frequency of the Tesla transformer, that's when you get, get the best balance of shape, uh, which Adrian's are centered on. Now, thus far, no one has been able to do this with the self-oscillating system. Adrian is the first one that's been able to do this with the self-oscillating system, which would mean that Adrian has managed to convince his oscillator to oscillate at the frequency that the coil resonates at, where uh, this is actually a rather difficult uh, thing to achieve in any type of self-oscillating radio frequency system because there has to be this phase offset to moderate the feedback. And that's why everyone else is getting these, uh, as Adrian called it, sword-like discharges. But here's, here's what I determined at the onset of this in my RCA laboratory in Bolinas is when you tune your VFO in your transmitter to off frequency from the resonant frequency of the test coil, as you go to one side, now I forget which one's what, um, but I would, would like to find out again, is uh, on one side of when you're getting off frequency, let's say you're going lower in frequency, uh, the discharge no longer has that beautiful curvature and, uh, and fullness. It starts to get into this projective stabbing sword-like frantic discharge, uh, which I call the roots. And you can hear it too, Eric. You can hear yeah. it. Right. Now, when you swing the knob on the VFO, back when there used to be knobs, there still is here, um, to the other side, to the high side, then it starts to get really coily and curvy, and uh, and I call that the branch mode. So looking at it from a biological standpoint, when the frequency is off resonance on one side, you get the roots. And when the frequency is off resonance on the other side, you get the branches. But when you have the frequency right where it's supposed to be, then you get that nice, full, curvy shape. So. I wish uh, that the system that I'm putting together for Aaron was developed to the point where, you know, we could show this, but um, I think that's asking for too much uh, with the time and money that's available uh, at this point, even though that is, uh, it is, is part of the system design and the, uh, the coil that, that Aaron has is uh, basically an extension of my Bolinas design, which was more of a spark making design rather than a communications uh, uh, type of design. And it, uh, it is capable of 20 kilowatts of power. And if the, uh, if the necessary funding and, and resources and backup could be acquired to bring that to the 20 kilowatt level, it would be absolutely outstanding, particularly uh, because this system has all the necessary feedback and modulation that uh, that the shape of the discharge actually can be enhanced and, and modified into uh, things that we may have never even seen yet. But uh, a 20 kilowatt transmitter custom made is a pretty good sized project. Uh, those forced air cooled tubes I try to stay away from because all the fans and the heating and all that. And uh, I usually stick with the glass tubes. The tubes I used in Bolinas for, which got me up to about 10 kilowatts, was the, uh, the 450T uh, 
IMAC triode, which uh, is good up to about 7,500 volts, even though the specs are, don't say that, but uh, they're very resistant to arc over and internally, in fact, my early childhood experiments, which were more you know, destructive and uh, undirected, uh, usually showed me that it would spark over the outside of the tube before the inside, but those particular IMAC designs. Um, they're very popular in the World War II uh, hard tube radar modulators because they just crank the voltage all the way up to 25,000. And these tubes handled it well. Uh, a, a triode that's still widely available, uh, relatively speaking, uh, that was used for diathermy machines is the uh, 304T IMAC triode. And uh, uh, the World War II radars were using those tubes up to 15,000 volts. So basically for, for the... Uh, the unit that I developed at the Integratron and moved to Santa Barbara, which unfortunately there's no video evidence left of, that used four 304 TLT triodes and gave me 10,000 watts of power. And I didn't have to fool around with any forced air and radiators. And, and I just... Uh, you just have to stand back. Stand back and make sure you don't get too close. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, you can get closer because you don't have that big, hot metal anode, you know, <laughs> just waiting to send you into the grave. Everything's still behind the glass for the most part. But uh, but nevertheless, yeah, it, it is extremely dangerous. And um, so I don't know, for a, a 20 kilowatt unit, I don't know what kind of uh, tube. Uh, my experience is at RCA, I, I always lean towards the water-cooled tubes because you didn't have all those damn fans. They didn't run so hot. Uh, they're very compact. And then that was the, uh, the RCA 891. And then there's the 891R where they soldered this big heavy radiator to it. And that thing just introduces all this straight capacitance and it's always running so damn hot and they're prone to parasitic oscillations. And so I've always uh, personally had a heavy aversion to forced air cooled tubes. And, uh, and the more modern ones really are not good at being beaten on like the uh, 4CX uh, 1500, which is very popular in, in military uh, medium power transmitters, is you can't really run them this heavy class C, class D, like you need to do for this high power, high efficiency pulse stuff. They're just simply, they're not made for that. Uh, this Russian tube looks like it is. I know it's very popular. A lot of people... Um, uh, there's one guy on YouTube, I think he calls himself Styro Pyro. And he <laughs> loves to blow up things and burn things up, you know, and he gets this crazy look on his face. And, and when he gets <laughs> pissed off, he smashes it against the wall. And <laughs> he's, he came up with some, uh, I forget what the YouTube title is, Soviet Death Machine or something <laughs> like that. And he's got this thing screeching away at 10,000 watts producing this. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they are beasts, those. those that, that GU5B is a beast of a tube. It really is. Um, so that, for... that, might, that very well may be, I don't know, if you, you were saying that you, you, you might have had some flashover or whatever with that. but uh, that, that Not on the GU5B. Not on the G. The 833C. If I try to push that up above about five kilovolts or so, I'm going to get a flashover on it. Well, yeah, the 833 is a low voltage too. And, it, but, and it's electrostatic stresses are really not, they're not balanced out very well. Yeah, indeed. Uh, you, you would be much better with a, a 250T or a 450T iMac triode if you want to go really insane power levels with uh, a vacuum type too. So I was operating in Belenus, I was operating uh, 6,300 volts on the plates of six, four dash, uh, the four. Four dash 250? Four 450Ts, six of them, four uh -huh. parallel. 
Uh, and I forgot how high the amp meter went, but uh, it didn't matter there because my laboratory had a convenient 500 kVA substation. <laughs> substation. Yeah, that's where the lights dim in the town next to it. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, I could always tell when they were simultaneously keying the transmitters when I was in town because the street lights would flicker with the more stuff. Uh, it's really too bad that. Uh, that I couldn't have kept on going at that location because that was the place to really get crazy with this stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but at any rate, uh, so yeah, I would like to get to the 20 kilowatt level, but then there's a lot of things I'd like to do. So, Eric, I can corroborate um, something you were sharing earlier um, in relation to when you go to the low side of the yeah. frequency, when you go to the high side. Yeah, you see, that's very pronounced. In this system so so in other words when you go because um the trick with the with the self oscillating basically you see you are oscillating at the parallel mode because you're using the parallel resonant mode of the of the of the of the tesla transformer um it gives you it gives you some real tuning flexibility either side of the of the series fundamental resonant point. So when you're on the low side, um, you can tune that. I can tune that one coil from about 2.4 mega cycles to 2.8 on the low side. And there you see, you see what you are referring to as the roots. The yeah. further you, the further you get away from the, from, from the center frequency and you need to keep the, the, the tube oscillating. So you have to make some, some adjustment to the grid bias and everything like that as you as you start heading down in frequency but it starts it starts opening out and when you flip to the other side so if you flip to the upper parallel resonant mode then you're going somewhere at around about three mega cycles up to about 3.4 mega cycles the thing really tightens up so it really tightens up the the discharge curves are much tighter and it all becomes much more like a ball. Yeah. So on the low side, it opens up. On the high side, it it all tends to curve in on itself um, um, like that. And you can do that on this. Actually, I will show that. I'll, I will show that at ESPC on this system um, because you've got some very fine – where on this system, you can adjust very fine tuning of frequency using, using the um, – um, it has a 10 kilovolt. Um, thousand picofarad um vacuum variable capacitor as the tr as the primary tuning um, uh, um capacitor and that that capacitor allows you to do some very very fine tuning of frequency above and below um obviously you can't do it at the series point because you're not driving it at that point the the yeah. the uh, uh, in your system where you were you were driving directly um, um, from an exciter, then you could drive it directly at the series mode, but you can't do that with this system. You have to drive it at, at, at the lower parallel or the upper parallel mode. Yeah, but, there's, a, there's a lot of advantages to using an external oscillator, and then yeah, yeah, because then you don't have all this interaction in this in the self oscillating mode. Everything is influencing everything else. The, the, one, is, the one distinct advantage of the self oscillating mode is is that frequency, uh, you know, potentially, and in your case, in actuality, uh, can hone right in on yep. what the discharge wants. Yep. You can hit the sweet spot of the discharge. Yeah, it can, it can, it's more adaptable. So, so my question is the important experiment, and this is something that, that, you know, goes all the way back to that condensed intro of Tesla transformer, paper that I wrote that Philo had me do after I lost my laboratory at RCA insisted that I write the whole thing up. And uh, I'm glad he did because that got me started in all this theoretical end of it. But um, the, it, what's needed is a big frequency oscillator. Mm -hmm. And the big frequency oscillator oscillates at the, what the so-called center frequency. And then the beat frequency oscillator goes into a product modulator and you get your sum and different frequencies out. And the, those sum and difference frequencies when put on a spectrum analyzer or you know, by ear quite possibly will tell you 
how the discharge is growing or shrinking because the frequency has to change with the size of the discharge. Well, you can hear it as well. You can, you can well, you very clearly. If you have a BFO, you should, it should make like a burping noise or maybe some kind of, uh, to me, that's like a very essential uh, mm -hmm. uh, test procedure to use for this is to, uh, is to run this into a balanced modulator, you know, like in the sideband receiver or something and get that bay frequency out and and that beat frequency will directly correspond to the growth and and decay of the discharge and per, and quite possibly be audible in other words that, that that i think is true again i can corroborate that what you're saying eric directly in this experiment because that will also come out in the slow motion um uh, uh photography so the slow motion video also shows because because I'm modulating it basically at the line frequency, um, the you can so you get a burst. So basically, you get a burst every um, if it's if it's bridge rectified, um, then I get a burst every ten milliseconds. If it's not bridge rectified, it's half wave rectified. It's a burst every twenty milliseconds, mm -hmm. and. If you are in the sweet spot, if you let the coil, if you let the generator tune right to the sweet spot, like you say, it becomes very, very quiet. It's just a background hum of the of the of the fifty or the hundred hertz. Um, so, depending so on you're, what. Sir, you're not using a keyer. You're using the rectifier uh, AC component then as your modulation. Yep. Um, oh. Well, I can do it two ways. I'm using the AC. As modulation, or obviously I can I can use a I can use an interrupter, so I can use an interrupter on the on the on the cathode side of the of, of yeah, the yeah that, that's the way I was doing it yeah I mean I mean so 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 both ways and the tube gives you very distinct feedback so for example if you if you tune the the tube um, in the self oscillation point and it's not at the right place then you start to hear it starts to become discontinuous because the tube stops oscillating for a moment and starts again and you hear that you hear that aggressive sound of the tube trying to start oscillating oh okay yeah that's a uh, the parasitic oscillation yeah you can hear you can hear it and when and so actually so, so it's basically running, it's kind of uh by your account, then it's kind of acting like a regenerative, regenerative receiver yes, as well yes. as transmit. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, it's acting. It, it, it's acting as a regenerative system. And but I think, but I think basically the BFO is, is the way to go in pure DC and 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 interrupter keying. You know, I tried it. I I tried it with pure DC. So on the bridge rectifier, I no, put. But you, have, um, but you have to interrupt it. It, it, yeah, it, and interrupt it too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. no, no, and, okay. and to interrupt it too, um, and it produces the same discharge. So if you if you if you do it DC, um, so I put um, I put an eight kilovolt thirty microfarad tank um, onto the onto the HT supply, which it really is a DC, and that yeah. is not something to get close to. That's um, not something to get close to at all. <laughs> no. um, um, so it is, and, and it measures as DC. So you can measure it with the high voltage probe as a DC, and then you interrupt it at the cathode. Um, if you interrupt it, um, um, I found that a similar low frequency, then you get the same you get the same type of discharge. Yeah, we're you better. Can do it both ways. Should, it should be better with the interrupter. I think it's more controllable with the interrupter. Yeah, it, it, it likes to turn on. It likes it when you turn on hard and fast. Yes, Mer yeah, yeah, Ab absolutely. Yeah, mercury switches are the best. That's what we use was mercury switches. In actual fact, it only works as burst mode. If you, if you, that is one of the that is um, one of the pre requirements. I mean, yeah, it will not you, work. It will not work continuous wave. It'll just shrink into a little fireball. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I can cooperate that as well. And, yeah. and, and when you go into that particular pulse mode, those tendrils will go up way beyond the arcing distance. Yes. It's a, it's a very unique form. And, and, and I'm really 
anxious to the point where I can duplicate what I did in Santa Barbara, where where in the cathode modulator I put music. And yeah, boy, you yeah that would be exciting. These, you should see what these things look like then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Boy. that would be exciting. <laughs> that, that's that's step two, I think. Well, that's what we're working on. We're on step one, but step yeah, two well, definitely we got to well, do. That's that. what that's what Aaron and I are building. This thing is not like uh, you know. This is like some kind of uh, this is something right out of uh, of uh, what was it um, the uh, uh, Oppenheimer's hole? Uh, what's the one in Col in, in New Mexico? Los Alamos. Los Alamos National Laboratories. I know because I glommed it. But just before I lost Landers, I managed to glom all the surplus from Los Alamos' original nuclear era. <laughs> oh, we're talking about truckloads and truckloads of tubes and transformers. And, and it looked exactly like what Aaron and I are putting together. Oh. And it, it's, it's got it's every mode. AM, FM, pulse, uh, you know, it's got all the provisions for feedback. Uh, this is not your ordinary radio transmit by any means. And, and oh. that's why it's 10 pounds of shit in a five pound bag, man, because I'll tell you, to fit all that stuff in those racks was uh, an amazing challenge. We're going to be and we're going to be working on that in about two weeks time. Yeah, that's cool. OK. Yeah. So we're we're at uh, two hours and uh, sixteen minutes now, running a little bit long. Um, we can open up for questions for a few minutes and yeah. wrap, wrap, wrap it up. Okay. So if anybody has any questions, I think if you go to the uh, oh what was that reactions option at the bottom, there's a thing to raise your hand. Okay, so we got a couple of questions here. Okay, and uh, if you can just introduce yourself, where you're from, uh, say who your question is addressed to, and go ahead and uh, ask it and if we can kind of keep the questions and answers brief yeah can you hear me okay. yeah go for it thanks just have the one question uh, i've been waiting to ask this for a while keep missing these meetings um so eric i know that you've talked about uh oliver heaviside often um what do you think of his conceptualization of the magnetic and electric potentials i believe it was heaviside who said the potentials must be murdered from the theory of electricity or something along those lines after that electric and magnetic scalar and vector potentials were treated merely as mathematical non-physical tools instead of physical realities it appears as though the physical reality of the magnetic vector potential at least has been experimentally proven uh the ah i can't pronounce this guy's name abraham boehm effect as well as the maxwell lodge effect on the classical level do you believe in the physical reality of the electric and magnetic potentials? Yeah, uh, Heaviside was was uh, uh, almost fanatically against the uh, the mathematical forms that were in uh, in common use in in analyzing electric fields and all that stuff. And and that was these uh, this what they called the potentials. They have no physical existence, and. Uh, and he advocated for their removal because all they really do is just cloud everything up. So, so basically, Heaviside removed all, all of the crap and uh, you know the mathematical baggage, which these academians still cling to to this day. That's why they hate him so much. Guys. <laughs> then after you know he hosed off all the uh, the marine slime off the bottom of the ship with the fire hoses, there was the nice shiny hull. And that's how we ended up with, uh, with a, a functional electromagnetic theory. But there's a drawback to that. Uh, the original stuff that he was opposed to uh, was actually taken to a more fruitful form by Hermann von Helmholtz, who went way beyond Maxwell. And, uh, and then we have to start getting back into this potential thing again. But it's not in the form of a, this extraneous, uh, glorifying uh, mathematical symbolism that you know is is like some kind of weird uh, ritual that you would do in in some deep corner of Africa, but it actually gets down to meterable, measurable stuff. So, so when we're talking about potentials, we're talking basically about electric waves, single energy electric waves to use Steinmetz's uh, 
terminology. Electric waves right now are double energy. They're magnetic and dielectric in a oscillatory exchange, uh, which um, you know basically finalized in these books I'm putting out based on heavy side and my own experiences and what have you. But um, but there's also the single energy where you can have an electrostatic wave or you can have uh, an electro dash magnetic wave without any energy exchange between the magnetic and dielectric fields. And that seems to be what this Tesla transmission is doing. Uh, Tesla was an avid follower of, uh, of Helmholtz. In fact, actually, I think Helmholtz even came to America uh, to see what Tesla was doing with his proposed uh, one wire transmission system. And, uh, and they had both come to agreement that yes, that was a workable system. Uh, Helmholtz material is basically all lost for the most part. Uh, he was not an avid writer like Heaviside. Uh, he had no interest in engineering, uh, unlike Heaviside, whose very basis was engineering. So uh, Mac, or Helmholtz material is basically all lost. Now I'm sure there's people on the planet that are much more adept to mathematics and sorting all that stuff out than I am that maybe could uh, tap Helmholtz's work. There's definitely something there. Uh, I, I produced a pamphlet uh, called The Revival of the Science of Electricity in the Digital Age, which is an yeah, Amazon that, that, that. And all the quotes are in there from people talking about Helmholtz and and I, so I kind of uh, I kind of show the direction that it has to go there, you know, the quotes from all the people and all that. So so that's basically when when you're talking about potentials or heavy sides talking about potentials, it was uh, a roundabout mathematical uh, extraneous uh, process to get to the uh, get to the engineering solution, and uh, and it, all it really did was. Uh, just make everything impossible to get to the bottom of. So Heaviside's contribution was to get rid of all that, but then the academians hate him for it. And uh, and Tesla basically, or not Tesla, but uh, but Heaviside has been pretty much erased out of all the, the normal discussion of electrical theory until you get into the basically the bell telephone guys and what have you. And then, then all of a sudden it pops back out in full glory, uh, mostly uh, the works of Ernst Gilliman. So it sounds like you believe in physical realities of the potentials, but just not necessarily the way it was originally described. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's one word, but it's being used for a completely different things like, like voltage. There's not one person on the earth to give you a straight answer of what voltage means. One of the main problems is, is because it has two meanings. It's either electrostatic potential, which is a dielectric form, or it's an electromotive force, which is a magnetic form, and they're not the same. They cannot be arbitrarily interchanged. And the only person to ever really present that or understand that was Steinmetz. He gets that into in his AC book, not directly, but practically. And uh so this is what uh, in these writings that I've talked about, these are the things that, you know, that I've spent almost the entirety of my adult life trying to sort out and did sort out, you know, mostly with the help of Skynets. Heaviside, like his contemporaries, was way too wrapped up in mathematical fantasia, like relativity, you know, and all these things and getting too wrapped up in Maxwell, you know, as the grand savior Jesus and, and we're not paying attention to anything else. But nevertheless, his his mathematical contribution to electrical engineering is priceless. So uh, I better stop at that point. Sure. Thank you. OK. Hey, thanks everybody, Mr. Dollard, Eric, uh, for putting this together. I think I speak for everyone. Everybody, uh, you know, we all appreciate what you're doing. Uh, I have a bench question and a theoretical question. Um, the I, the uh, theoretical question. Well, maybe I'll mention the bench because I mean that's important. Um, I was just looking how to build a coil um, that that generates a volt 
And no matter how many windings I put on it or the shape or, you know, like it's supposed to be number of turns times current. And there's obviously many more factors in there. And, um, you know, I, if anyone's kind enough to show me how to build a coil that gets a volt without using an op amp, I, that, that's my solution. I used an op amp to generate a volt out of a co coil. Let me be more clear, just a magnet pass on a coil, any, you know, uh, neodymium, ceramic eight, whatever, uh, I'm having trouble with that. And my theoretical question um, is that uh, in your origin of energy synthesis, uh, you, sh you talked about how uh, between the two wires that uh, the the charge would, uh, the wire worked as something of a mirror and w in, in conjunction with the dielectric. And uh, I was just trying to fit that in my head, what exactly you meant when the wire was some kind of mirror in the, in the dielectric and um, maybe it'd be helpful if you could just explain how uh, the charge and the energy goes down the wire. You know, I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, I've, I've done that rather extensively in these writings that I've talked about. Okay. So, so basically, uh, the wires are the reflectors and the the dielectric is the, is, a, is the, how would you say, the transparent, transparent mm -hmm. part of it. So... Basically, that's why you got to have more than one wire is it, it forms a boundary. It reflects the electromagnetism and the, the dielectric is uh, conveys the electromagnetism. That's, that's why when you, you put different dielectrics in that have different uh, uh, refractive indexes for light that mm changes the velocity of the wave because refractive index and electrostatic capacity are very, very close to the same thing. As far mm -hmm. as you're talking about a bolt out of a coil or what have you, I, I don't really have enough information that, to answer any of that because I don't know exactly what you're trying to do, but it doesn't sound like it's any of the resonance stuff. It sounds like you're just trying to do a basic Faraday thing with the galvanometer, a magnet, and a coil. And uh, you shouldn't have any problems with that at all. So you must be making either something's very broken or you're making a very fundamental mistake. Right. I may have shorted the coil or something. I can't figure it out either, but I really appreciate it. And uh, I enjoy your four quadrant representation book. I just finished it last night. So I got to go over it again, but I, I enjoyed it. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Hey there. Um, I just had a quick question here. Um, I had, I'm trying to do a basic experiment here with a resonance in, an, in a hydroxy HHO cell. And uh, I have the negative inductance in the cell. And I just wanted to know if, what that means exactly. And if I can cancel it out by adding a positive inductor to get a resonant frequency. Mm, yeah, I don't know exactly what you mean by negative inductance, but uh, it sounds like if you wanted to resonate, you would have to have a negative capacitance. And not necessarily a negative inductor. Well, I simply got an LCR meter and I connected the red lead to the... Oh, no, no, that'll just give, that's all digital stuff. You can't, that doesn't work for any of this. Well, I'm, I'm yeah, simply you trying to, to back, you have to go back to the old, old ways of using, you know, electrodynamic instruments. If, if, if meter is reading negative because it doesn't know what's going on, it's not that it's a negative inductance. Well, well, I'm, let's just say I connected it to something that is just plates with, with a salt, you know, salt water in between. So essentially it's like a capacitive thing that has no inductance or something. Do you know what a negative inductance would mean on a meter? Uh, it means that the meter doesn't know what's going on. Okay. Okay. So how could I, what would I use to find the actual inductance then in this, in a dry cell, a hydroxy uh, electrolyzer? Well, the inductance would be so small, there's almost no way that you can't do it. If I can just add, um, also, um, uh, uh, Travis, when you use a conventional LCR meter, like um, like a handheld or digital or something like that, if you get a negative result like that, it usually means that the instrument is out of range in terms it won't be out. It, it's 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 not within its 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 
preferred operating point. So in other words, if it's giving you a negative result, um, how to say it, it's, it's, it's like you think you have it on the inductive range, but in actual fact, what you're measuring is capacitive. And then it, it can't measure it. It becomes negative then. That, that's quite common. So all capacitors would have would have some inductance. Then it just be very small. Your your yeah. cell must have an inductance, as Eric said. It will be very small. Okay. It'd be it'd be in the order of a micro micro Henry, which is almost unmeasurable. Yeah. So so what so how could I get a? Um, is there a way to just you know find the number to find a resonant frequency for something with such a small? inductance or should i just add an inductor in there and then i can make it my own frequency what i want it to be well the, what you have with the electrolytic cell is a parametric capacitance yeah so, and that means uh, uh accordingly you would need a parametric inductance and that starts to get into some really complicated from the, from the theoretical standpoint uh it's insoluble from the experimental standpoint it's like pulling the handle on a slot machine so so can you, can so you explain that basically, basically what you need to do is you need to 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 determine what's called the volt amper characteristics of your cell and draw a graph of uh of voltage versus current or okay. current versus voltage uh -huh. at some rate you know like like uh, charging a battery kind of thing yeah, it has a yeah, charging and, curve. And, and so and draw that curve. So if you put in like a real slow sine wave, like you know one cycle a second, or something like that, something you can do by hand, and then draw the current wave, and then do the same thing with the constant current generator and draw the voltage wave. That gives you the volt amper characteristics. And if if you plot them uh, against each other to, to make a loop then you'll see the loop has a, a twist or a kink in it that's called, uh, called the hysteresis cycle. And, and that's where these energy anomalies occurs in the hysteresis cycle. That's what I'm looking for. It's a little bit slightly over my head, but I would need to do one test with a sine wave and one test with DC. Is that what you're saying? No, what you need to do is you, is you need to take a, a DC constant current source uh -huh. and vary the current by hand yeah yeah just do the curve i got and, that part and, and graph the voltage and then you need to take a constant potential source which is a lot easier to find than a constant current source and then you need to vary the voltage and and measure the current and see what kind of waveform that produces so okay so it's a voltage curve it's, it's like a curve of voltage and amperage yeah, it's called curve tracing. It's like what you do with tubes and transistors. Yeah, how much how much energy will flow through it? It's just yeah, like how you would. Another another one is the hysteresis curve. That's the one you're okay. after. Hysteresis yeah. curve. And I'm, at this point, I'm I'm at a loss to come up with a way right out of my head, uh, you know, to arrive at that. But uh, you know, Steinmetz put loads and loads of work into that. But of course, it's all pretty much on a mathematical basis. So, but. Um, that's All right. The problem with this is you got to get kind of a, a little more, you know, theoretical uh, foundation before you know you just start hooking shit up and because this digital stuff, I, I absolutely, absolutely refuse to use any digital instruments whatsoever except for frequency counters or timers. Wow. <laughs> because, so so how how do I measure this this voltage this capacitance curve and how do you measure capacitance uh, with an analog thing? What is that? Well, you're not you're not going to be able to. The capacitance is going to be too weird for any capacitance meter. So basically, what you're just going to have to do is you can use. Uh, I meant to say inductance. I'm sorry. I got the capacitance, and it does vary you slightly. Will, but... You will not be able to measure the inductance. It's way too small. It'll be impossible to measure it. The inductance of the connecting leads will be. So I should be able to just add an inductor in the circuit then and create just a, a resonant frequency no. in a circuit. No. 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 Okay. No. no, no. no. If I could just add also to what Eric has um, also shared as a possibility, another possibility, Travis, I don't know what your access to instrumentation or engineering know-how is, but for me, I would that is a that is a prime candidate to measure with a vector network analyzer. So that basically sounds, I, sounds expensive. <laughs> it is. Well, it doesn't have to be. If you if you go and get my presentation from last year. Um, I give a very detailed presentation on how to use um, a very low-cost VNA 
but if you treat your system as basically just like any other two port network, if you measure um, using a VNA, it's 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 S one one, so it's basically it's um, it's it's input impedance or it's it's reflection coefficient, and you measure its transmission gain. Um, it will entirely characterize the resonant properties of that cell entirely. It's a very, very good exercise for a vector network analyzer. Vector network analyzer. Okay, just one last piece here to maybe clarify. I do have a capacitance in this water. It's a, it's approximately 12 uh, micro uh, uh, farads. So um, I, I just want to basically charge and discharge this water and just experiment with starting there. With the, that's my very first most simple project. But is there any ideas? of how to, yeah, how do you resonantly charge and discharge water capacitor? It shouldn't be that hard, should it? Does it just be, yeah, why can't it be done? <clears throat> because it's polar. The capacitor exchanges polar. with voltage. But there's, the water has electrolyte in it, and I can vary it between, you know, very dielectric to more conductive. It does have a very high resistance in the water. Uh, is it just not a good enough? Yeah, why can't I resonate? Uh, have a resonant charge and discharge with the water capacitor. Uh, water where it's it's two metal plates with the water in between with conductive ions in it. But you, um, can, you can do that, Travis, but you need yeah. the right equipment for it. Uh, okay. uh, you need to resonate it. You first of all need to find out its, 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 its intrinsic self-resonant frequency, and then you need to excite it at that resonant frequency. Yes. How do, how, what is this intrinsic self-resonant frequency? How do you well, find uh, that? That is what you have to measure, either okay. as Eric um, suggests you do, which will yield you that information, or like I suggested, to use a vector network analyzer. We'll also okay. give you that information. All right, I'll be researching those two things. Thank you so much. Hey, Tra and Travis, I have something to say about that. Yeah. So the, um, <clears throat> uh, let's see, I don't know if that's working or not. So on your, this water cell, are you looking to also do water splitting with it yeah yeah it's for electrolysis and i okay. my first is just using dc but yeah okay so i might be able to give you a shortcut that bypasses almost all of this one of them is with that water cell um it's either called a what is it a phase lock loop or a phase loop lock circuit uh they're not that expensive you can build one for probably 30 bucks worth of parts or something there are some PLL circuits for electrolysis online. You can probably find them in my forum, uh, energeticforum.com. And when you put it on your cell, that will pulse the DC into the cell and it will automatically adjust to the most efficient uh, frequency for that particular cell because it's going to constantly change. Temperature is going to make that frequency change. The water is going to be sloshing around possibly. That can make the frequency change. And what the PLL circuit does is it will constantly adjust for that so you always have the optimum frequency that is pulsing at for that cell's particular condition at any given time. I was actually going okay. to put that, I was actually going to put one of those into production for uh, so-called HHO cells in the past. Yeah. But look up, but look up the uh, phase. So the that's phase basically, block. Yeah. it's basically track, it's a feedback circuit. It's able basically, to track correct. Re resonance reaction. So. Correct. Cool. But then, uh, so do I, when I find resonance on this type of water cell, if I, um, what will I see when I do achieve resonance? Like I have, you know, PWMs that I can turn the dial for the frequency. And then do I see the voltage no. just drop and then yeah, the you, current, stay, the gas stays the same? Yeah. You don't, you don't need a PWM. That PLL circuit will do it for you. And then all you got to do is just put your scope on that circuit to see what frequency it's pulsing at. And then you'll know that that thing is being pulsed at the most. Um, That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. But but it's either phase lock loop or phase loop lock. I can't oh, remember. Phase, phase, phase lock loop. Phase Fa yeah. Loop. Yeah. 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 Phase lock loop. And you can find full schematics online for a phase lock loop uh, HHO circuit. Uh, the, the, the schematics are there. I mean, I, I took one That's right off great. the internet. And I would recommend looking at that because that's specific to your application. And you've, I, you've tried one and seen it working? No, I had designed the whole thing out on a PC board and everything because I was going to put it into production. And somebody who shared that schematic online, um, it's already proven. It's it's not really a magical proprietary okay. circuit or anything. It's pretty standard off-the-shelf parts. You could cool. probably build one for under 50 bucks. And I think that that's kind of what you're looking for. And in addition yeah. to that circuit, 
um, I would recommend getting uh, Adrian's presentation from last year when he's mentioning the Vector Network Analyzer. A few hundred bucks on eBay and you can get one of these and that'll give you, that'll kind of take take everything to the next level. Yeah. But, but yeah, that's all that, I have to say about it. Yes, I am going to research that. Thank you so much. Okay. And uh, sure. just one last thing to mention really quick is uh, with your your multi-wave oscillator, the Lakovsky thing, uh, I did just notice that um, the I think the carrier frequency, it's so incredibly close and it's in the range that Lakovsky, I think, was studying uh -huh. that if you slightly, slightly adjusted your carrier wave, I forgot what what number is it tuned to again? It's I think uh, it's, uh, mid, mid to low 700 kilocycle range, I believe. Um, I thought there was a, I thought there was like a main frequency center frequency of it or something that was a lot higher, like in the megahertz or something. No, the, the, the Bedini sideband generator. The oh, right that's what I meant to say. Yes. The RPS. Okay. What's the frequency of that one? So the carrier on that is 3.1 megahertz. And then the audio sweep is from about 100 Hertz to 150 kilohertz. <coughs> yeah. Right, so right. Yeah. If you simply take that 3.1 um, kilohertz and you make it 3.4 megahertz. Okay, uh, megahertz, you make it 3.24 megahertz, then uh, what you notice is 432 is one of the harmonics in there. It mm -hmm. becomes extremely resonant because what I believe is that the key to this music and resonance, it is um, the most divisible numbers you could possibly find. And those numbers include 540, 360, 432. And uh, basically the most resonant possible type of music is called just intonation because it's based purely on the natural harmonics. And 432 hertz is basically the most resonant number, um, so, you know, up oh. to the... So, so, you, so I can, yeah. So, so you can, uh, so the uh, carrier frequency, I guess you could say it's kind of arbitrary because you can, depending on what audio frequency you put in, you can create sidebands that'll be harmonics of that frequency. So you can make it with almost any carrier. But, but if you, like, but, but if you make it 3.24 megahertz, then 432 as a, as a, as a, um, mm -hmm. one of those harmonics, it's already baked in the cake. So it's, you don't have to enter any frequency. It mm -hmm. already contains all these frequencies that I'm working with. I have a pretty big discovery about light and sound. But the point is, if you just make it 3.24 kilohertz, mm -hmm. uh, megahertz, then it's in resonance with all multiples of 432, all harmonics. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a whole musical system and it's the most perfect musical system that exists mm -hmm. and it's called just intonation and you that just want actually, to actually that's not correct what do you mean that's not correct uh the the perfect system is uh it's uh based on the uh, pythagorean harmonic series i gave a number of presentations of this and it's 426 and two-thirds it's, How uh, could that possibly be, though? How could that be? I'm because... not going to, right now, I don't have time to get into that. Okay. The 432 sure. thing is a fad. Uh, in actuality, no. no. If you're, if you're going to produce... If, well, well, let's just say this. Uh, if okay, you want... okay, at least I'm not going to argue. Let's go on okay. to the next question. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Travis, you can look at the uh, Power of Ether presentation, and you'll see all the math in there, and and uh, you'll, you'll you'll see what he's referring to. But in any case, w just give me that frequency real quick, the megahertz. It was 3.24, and the only reason I say this is because mm -hmm. if you don't want any decimals in all of your notes, then you can't use 426 point whatever. It has to be a whole number. If you want all whole number waves to create standing waves that are perfectly in alignment, there's only one way to perfectly do that. If you want no decimals in any of your frequencies, and that's very easy to do that. And just intonation is based on the harmonic series. So that's what is the universe is based on. So I don't know how Pythagoras' system of his intervals was created first, but it's not perfect. It's one way, it's one way, but just intonation huh is based on harmonics. So whatever you want to say about it. Uh, the, the Pythagorean system is based on harmonics. The just intonation system is inharmonic. 
What do you mean? Just intonation is well, based on multiples. I don't, I don't want to carry this out any farther because we're, we're taking questions away from other people. That's, okay. Those are the facts. Those are what you get on the oscilloscope. Those are the facts. Okay, I'll have to research so, your, your so presentation. So you're just going to have to go back and restudy that stuff. I would recommend that you read a book called, uh, uh, the, what's the name of it? That was the, uh, the Hans Kaiser book? No, oh, that's, that's, you can't find that. No, the, the guy that wrote that, remember, he wrote the book, uh, The Music of the Spheres. Yeah. It's all in there. Not the fraudulent one by Guy Virgie. But the real one, which was, what was the guy's name? Jamie Jameson something? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, all, that's all in there. See. And then then I get it in the musical seismograph. Uh, this is I it. Get, I get in the detailed depth about that. Also in the, uh, the Fortescue presentation. Jamie get, James? Yeah, yeah. Is, so, that, is that it right there? Yeah, so basically... Uh, yeah, that's the one. If I have the means, you know, the equipment uh, to make what I call the Pythagorean waveform, which no one really has attempted to do yet, would be right behind me now in the video screen. But uh, that's two uh, 11 and a half foot high Western electric racks of equipment, and it's not happening. But uh, if, if I could, that's the thing that I'm most interested in right now. Well, I would just like to understand what you, why is it, what, what you mean about what is it that you see on a scope that makes well, it better? Well, that's, that's why you have to get into presentations. The problem Which is one? Like, Which... We're, we're way too far off track and other people want to ask questions. Sure, sure, sure. So it's the power of ether as related to music and electricity, which is available on emediapress.com. And then uh, the, 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 the musical seismograph uh, really gets into it solid. Musical seismograph. Yeah. And then this book here, Music of the Spheres, Music, Science, and the Natural Order of the Universe by Jamie James. Uh, you can get a used copy for four bucks on Amazon. So, Yeah, when I, when I got a copy of that book, it knocked me out of my chair. And I, I didn't. I'd forgotten about all this stuff, you know, that I'd studied when I studied music in college. And... Uh, Boy, that, that guy hit the nail right on the head. I, I've written hundreds of pages on the subject after that. It's, it's all scattered throughout the energetic form. It needs to be actually distilled into a book where it's easily accessible by people. Okay. Um, okay, well, anyway, thanks, Travis. Um, I'm going to uh, read this question from Max. Uh, let's see. It's my, un it's my amateur under this from Max R., it's my understanding that Mr. Dollard is speaking about something different or separate from uh, what Bearden is teaching in electrical theory videos, but to my neophyte perception, both teachings almost sound identical. Uh, scalar wave phase conjugation, broken symmetry, uh, cold electrical current ad infinitum. Is this a mistake to say they're both the same? Um, I don't know if you, you want to come on comment on that. Well, area. You know how I feel about Tom Bearden. Yeah. Tom, so, Tom Bearden was a, uh, a military disinformant that, uh, that basically thoroughly destroys any possibility of understanding the work of Tesla. Uh, Bearden, Tom Bearden and John Bedini had allied forces and, uh, as, as a pair they're probably the most destructive element in the understanding of Nikola Tesla that's ever existed since Albert Einstein. So pay absolutely no attention to anything that Tom Bearden says. It's all sensationalism. It's all tied into academia. And its principal objective is to get you so confused that you'll never be able to make anything to work. I actually met the guy personally, and he went through an incredible amount of effort to try to scare me away from all this stuff and what have you, but uh, you can't scare a coyote. And that coincides with the whole scalar wave terminology. It does not find itself to be evident in practical uh, electrical engineering as applicable to Tesla. It's just more of a conjured fad, as you would say. It, it, the scalar wave is actually a, a self-defeating, uh, uh, how would you call it, oxymoron, because the scalar is the part that doesn't wave. Mm -hmm. And it, it all finds its root into this uh, potential garbage that uh, 
that a previous uh, question asker brought up. Uh, it's it's just saturated with that stuff, and and Bearden does nothing but badmouth uh, heavy side from from one end to the other, and uh, created this whole Soviet scalar wave conspiracy, and it all goes into you know the uh, the chemtrails and the flat Earth, and you know we never landed on the moon, and the Soviet scalar conspiracy, and. Uh, and really, I would not recommend that if I had any more than uh, a pint of alcohol in my belly that you ever bring anything like that up around me. <laughs> and, and unfortunately, uh, this 432 cycle per second thing has all gone off into the same fantastic lunacy uh, is in trying to be in contradistinction to 440, which is way off. And uh, and the 426 and two thirds is is geometrically intrinsic with the whole harmonic process because uh, the, the musical tone C has to be 256, which is a, a Pythagorean number. So you mentioned Hans Kaiser. Uh, Hans Kaiser was a. Uh, uh, kind of a uh, spiritual theoretician and a crystallographer and all that, a German guy uh, whose work unfortunately had to be carried out in World War II. And he's the one that took the, the Pythagorean understanding to the maximum. And I have, have found that applying the Pythagorean understanding to more advanced music theory and polyphase theory, uh, particularly in my work with this Tesla four phase, uh, for something so unknown and archaic and uh, uh, the, its analytical power is absolutely fantastic. And, and that book, uh, Music of the Spheres, lays all the groundwork for understanding that. And then I wrote a paper on the energetic form of something about Verser algebra from Pythagoras to Steinmetz, I believe is the title, where I had carried the... Uh, the music of the spheres work to the next step and uh, and showed how over time the musical scales had devolved. And in fact, actually, that is a complication I'm dealing with now in this musical analysis I'm doing is because after the death of Bach, uh, most of the musical stuff started to fall apart. Uh, a lot of the uh, the symbols uh, disappeared. The uh, the bandwidths and uh, frequency allocations all got changed around and, uh, and we're led to believe that that box legacy was equal temperament, which is uh, a complete abomination from the harmonic standpoint. And none of those musicians at that time ever used equal temperament. They all uh, derived out of what the prior uh, question asker talked about, the just, the just intonation and every composer and musician had modified the just intonation, which still did not work good for polyphonic music. And every single composer had his own musical scale uh, fine-tuned to the, the organs or the instruments that they were using. And before the keyboard appeared, which basically made music digital, uh, this wasn't so much of a problem because Basically, uh, the human voice was the principal instrument, and most instruments were were frequency variables. So, so the uh, the dominant uh, frequencies were no longer constant, or were not constant, not made constant like now. But they were able to to wander around and keep the thing in phase lock. All of this has been lost for music. Uh, this is the thing that I have to bring back with the musical seismograph because I have to keep the uh, you know, the spatial coordinate system of the inside of the earth is a sphere uh, listening to these signals to keep all that harmonic uh, structure solid to convert it into something that the human brain would resolve. And you could not do that with equal temperament. It had to be done with Pythagorean uh, frequency bands because they're all harmonically related. You don't get beats and howls and, and pulsations. And particularly being you have to preserve the stereo image, you can't have any phase glitches at all. So that's where this Pythagorean master oscillator, there's five frequencies in the Pythagorean musical scale, and they have to be such that when you play all of them simultaneously, 
if you look at them on a oscilloscope, the waveform has to be still. And it takes a special oscillator modulator to do that. And I, I present that, uh, you know, in its theoretical and, and possible manifestation in the uh, musical seismograph video, which is probably the most complete uh, um, presentation that you're going to find on this subject to date. Okay. So we're five minutes until three hours. So we're definitely going to have to wrap this up. Yeah. I got to feed the meter. <laughs> so, uh, okay, Victor, I'll give you the last question. There's a couple questions in the uh, chat we're not going to be able to get to, but uh, Victor, if we can make the question quick quick, and the answer quick, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Because I still got to go through all this and add some subtitles and all that, and that's time consuming. Plus, uh, Zoom only gives me X amount of gigabytes for the live call to be recorded and stuff, and uh, I don't want to max that out. So uh, go ahead, Victor. I would like to quote him in YouTube videos. Yeah, I mean, brief quotes, that's no problem. Yeah, just give a reference, just give a reference to the book title and it's at emediapress.com as an ebook or, you know, Amazon as a paperback. I think Amazon's the only place you can get it as a paperback that I know of. But yeah, go ahead, Victor. That's no problem. Okay. Okay. Uh, Two hours, 56 minutes. Um, time's up. <laughs> so uh, thanks to everybody for being on the call. Uh, this will be on YouTube. I don't know, maybe by the end of next week or something like that. It's going to be a next, it's going to be a busy next uh, five, six weeks. Uh, we're going to be swamped. But uh, yeah, come visit us at the conference, energyscience.com, uh, energyscienceconference.com. Tickets are on emediapress.com. And uh, whatever you're able to help out uh, financially, uh, ericpdollar.com forward slash donations. Uh, that'll help us out also during the month of April for a lot of the projects we're going to be doing. And uh, so we'll see you on the next call. I think uh, this is the 18th. So if we're going to do one, two, three, let's see, one, two, three weeks from now is the eighth. Uh, we might be able to do Did a call in the... Yeah, go ahead. Aaron, uh, did you want to do it maybe on a four week because we're going to do that bi weekly thing? Yeah. You want to maybe do it in four weeks' time. So that'd be the 15th. That might work out better anyway because on the 7th and 8th, is that a New York Times best selling author coming to the shop to interview mm -hmm. us on what, what we discussed? And that'll be on the 7th and 8th. So should we schedule for the 15th? Does that sound good to you, Eric? You'll, you'll be here anyway, so. Yeah, when, whenever, yeah. It, okay. It's time to settle in and maybe, you know, show some pictures of what we're working on. Okay. So on uh, April 15th, noon, uh, Pacific time or Pacific daylight savings time, uh, Washington state time, uh, we'll do another uh, call like this. It'll be from the shop. And at that time, uh, Adrian and Eric both will actually be with me in person there at, at, at the at the shop <clears throat> and so we'll go ahead and do that next call i'll send out uh, the the registration link out on energy times and give a couple of reminders and stuff like that so we'll see everybody on the call in four weeks and i'll see you eric here coming up pretty soon in about 10 days 12 days or something like that we'll see you adrian here in about two weeks something like yep. that and uh we'll be sharing uh, the progress what's going on at the shop so Stay tuned and thanks for uh, being on the call, everybody. And we'll see you next time. Aaron, thank you. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I'll be in touch. Take care, everybody.